hopefully hear me. Uh, EIT Digital, what it is, it's uh, your, we are European entrepreneurs in digital innovation and education. So it means that uh, we try to foster and uh, bring entrepreneurial uh, spirit and, uh, and uh, digital transformation to Europe. And uh, this is what we are about. We are seven nodes. One of those is Helsinki, and we are also active in, in, in uh, smart city areas. So, and uh, yes, this is the European Entrepreneurs slide. So we are educating new students for digital economy. Uh, we are accelerating companies that uh, are grasping these opportunities of digital economy. And, uh, and we are doing this in, in a network that is consisting of uh, best universities, uh, best uh, companies, and best research institutes. So all in all, we have uh, something like uh, two thirds of the European R&D in ICT under our footprint. So we have the big, biggest countries, uh, in ICT research, we have Germany, France, Finland, Sweden, uh, UK, and so forth, and we have the biggest companies. And uh, our mandate and charter is really to drive this uh, uh, digital transformation. So what, what are we doing? We are, as one of our activities, we have uh, innovation action lines, uh, eight of them, that are focusing on uh, traditional European strengths, uh, for example, cyber physical systems, uh, meaning industries, manufacturing industries. We have uh, future cloud technologies. We have uh, uh, future networking solutions, health and well-being, and so forth. But more importantly for this event, we have uh, urban life and mobility action line and we have Smart Spaces Action Line. Smart Spaces Action Line has been focusing on retail, smart buildings uh, mainly, and uh, in urban life and mobility, we, we are also active and trying to get uh, more interactive city environments. And our job is to really make uh, these ideas that are coming make them into market, turn the research results into money, and uh, make these digital entrepreneurs. So all of these, for example, these action lines, they have summer schools uh, that are uh, educating students in, in those, those areas. Uh, and we have uh, master and doctoral schools also that are taking these in their topics in their curricula. So the mentioned uh, action lines that are closest to this smart uh, spaces topic are no, the, the smart cities topic are smart spaces and urban life and mobility. And uh, <coughs> let's say we are part of this project even though it's uh, uh, not uh, funded by, by EIT at the moment it's funded by EU, EU the, the preparation. But our take and our stance in this is that uh, how can we uh, make this dual city approach of uh, Helsinki and uh, Tallinn in, into something special? How can we uh, find a suitable crisp topic for this uh, center of excellence in, in Tallinn side that uh, would help us to deliver the results that we are supposed to deliver, so digital transformation of Europe. And uh, so we want to see some ingredients and some results uh, for our urban life and mobility side that uh, uh, would be then uh, reproducible or re reusable in, in other cities as well. So this is uh, maybe the... the hope for this uh, workshop today that uh, how can we create that kind of crisp concept uh, having these two aspects in mind that the, the dual city nature of uh, Helsinki and Tallinn and, uh, 
new concepts. And this so sh shows our network, by the way. We have the Berlin, Eindhoven, Helsinki, London, Paris, Stockholm, and, uh, and uh, what is that last one? I should remember it, but Trento, it's, it's uh, yes. So those are, by the way, those places where the biggest number of uh, European uh, unicorns, the companies that uh, are growing fast and reaching the one billion mark uh, have been growing. London leading there. But uh, this is uh, to set the scene for this uh, workshop today. So as you, as you can see, the program, the, the <coughs> program is very tight. Watch the clock here and Kello Kalle as the finish thing goes. For me it's close, but otherwise. Um, and then all the discussions are, are supposed to happen on, on, on short break and, and, and in the end of this session, so un until five o'clock. So, uh, about the project itself, the finest the twins. Oh, wait, the, the, your last slide is here, but well, you already said everything written there, so we can skip that. Finest twins. Project funded by not EIT directly, but but EU uh, teaming program. Uh, uh, we uh, we are planning Center of Excellence, which is EU slang. You probably know this language research center uh, that should be very independent, located in Estonia. Uh, and uh, uh, focusing on, on research and development and innovation studies of, of, of smart city, thinking what is smart city and how, how could it be sort of helped or, or utilized. And usually there are six or, or main themes in, in smart city discussions and we, we have chosen three of them, mobility, environment and living. I'll, I'll say more about them immediately. And, and of course, this, this twin city or dual city or however we will call it is, is interesting setting, this Talsinki or, or Helsinki Tallinn setting and, and all the cross-border activities. Uh, so, as I said, you're all here to contribute or comment uh, this, this uh, science and innovation program and strategy that we are writing in this project, it's in, in, in my responsibility especially. And the Science Innovation Plan includes well, the spearhead thematic areas, which is perhaps the, the, the most interesting thing. And then, then metrics, how to, how to meter how good is the research and activity in, in that becoming center of excellence. Uh, and of course, involving academic and, and, and industry partners. And this is a bit exciting uh, activity in the sense that, of course, it's not sure that we are able to build that center of excellence. We are competing with, with uh, 31 or something like that, similar project in, in Europe, having totally different domains, medicine and, 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 and whatever, not all in smart city thematics. So if, if our plan is good enough, the business plan is called, then, then we are able to get the 15 to 20 million EU money, and then, then of course it needs more private money or, or, or business money, but then, then we are able to start the, the action. So this is not automatic process, but we are in, in, in a strong uh, competing position. So about the thematic uh, areas of spearhead thematic areas. Uh, as I said, this is the, the typical six areas that I mentioned, or, or, or the building bricks of, of a smart city. Hugely big areas. How to define them? Impossible, of course. You can, you can make lists 
under the names. Uh, that's why we've chosen only three, three of them. And, and our job is now, now to think of what kind of mobility, what kind of environment and, and, and living, what, what we think and understand about them. Here are some starting points uh, from, from the, uh, for the, the whole, whole, whole project and the center of excellence. So as I said, the Talsinki Twin City setting, cross-border activities, uh, and the question who's uh, if you talk about smart city, then the question, who's smart city? Is it, is it, is it citizens or, or, or big companies or is it ICT domain that is ruling? There, there are big questions of power. Uh, is the open data really open? How can it be really open? And then the great Nordic phenomenon called quadruple helix, meaning the idea that, that not only Siemens itself will do everything, or, or some other big company having, of course, resources for it, but it's more sort of collaborative model where governmental actors and, and, and universities, industry partners, of course, and citizens themselves are, are together making plans, urban planning and, and all kind of participation. Uh, so, about Smart mobility might be something like that. The first one is, is word joke, everything as a concept. Uh, and then Mars is mobility as a service is, is one sort of repeating saying, and then we can say Mars as a concept. So, so it's, it's still a concept, it's not working. The great Helsinki model doesn't work even, even here. So it's interesting thing to, to study what's, what's happening there, what kind of possibilities there would be. Uh, well, I'm not reading through the whole, whole list, you can, you can browse them. Um, well, flexible working labor models might be interesting because, as, as, as we know, there are a huge amount of people traveling all the time from, from Estonia, Tallinn to Helsinki and, and, and southern Finland and back, and, and how, how this, you know, uh, formulate people's lives and, and, and their sort of resources. Highly interesting setting. Uh, well, smart parking, which is my personal whimsy, uh, should be seen as, as a part of, of smart buildings. For instance, this is very smart building, but parking is very stupid over behind the building, as uh, perhaps you realized. How many of you, by the way, took the parking permission paper and went back to the car and back to here? Yeah. Good example of not so smart building. All right, um, smart environment. Uh, two main areas. Is, is it? Uh, are we thinking about sustainability, sustainable development, etc.? The very sort of already traditional from from 1970s or 80s in Finland, uh, saving energy, uh, perhaps urban air quality is, is more modern thing or. or Newer thing, or should we think smart environments more, more like public spaces, semi public spaces, urban spaces? Uh, are the buildings informative? Uh, how's the lightning? <clears throat> how, how people can inter interact in, in public spaces? Uh, are they facilitated so that they can interact there more easily than currently? Uh, and of course, very strong area in Finland is this management or surveillance. CCTV cameras, etc., because our legislation is, is so sort of free. Uh, well, my background is in, in sociologist, must be said, I'm an urban sociologist. Uh, so I'm interested in, in, in well, what is consumer and what is the position of consumer in, in smart city? Are we are we studying sort of um, consumeristic? point of view so that it's good to consume, it's good to buy new things, it's good to buy new iPhone, etc. cetera. Uh, or should we be more, more critical that, that consuming more and more is not so great thing? Uh, I have no personal opinion, but, but just as an example of, of this point of view. Smart living then, uh, very big things, gamification, everything, or perhaps not everything, but a lot can be studied as, as, as games and, and as interaction processes can be formulated as, as, as games. I'm not well, 
personally specialist in that area. Social inclusion, huge thing, how people could be collaborate more, uh, feel being part of something, not, not alienated, alone, bowling alone, so to speak. Uh, then the smart governance, which is perhaps stronger in, 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 in Estonia side at the moment, everything, how could be transparent, etc. Different silos working together as the X-Road concept is, is furthering. Uh, and then this urban planning, and, and I suppose we, are, we will hear some presentations dealing with that, so how people could participate more and I feel, feel as a, more like members in, in, in planning. Uh, so, uh, about the, the smart city center of excellence, uh, uh, Alt University will, will definitely participate in it somehow, but for your information that, that enthusiastic professors are, are looked for to, to be sort of carrier or owner committed professors or, or well, senior teachers, I suppose, uh, are, are needed to be fine, and we are looking for them in, in, in this university. Uh, and also business partners, uh, Forum Virum Helsinki is perhaps more, more keen, keen on, on that, but I'm, I'm, I'm helping if I can. Uh, but we will hear about that later, perhaps not in this seminar, but, but later on. So this is the, the Smart Twin City EU is, is, is the website of this project. They are already something. They look, look, look very great. Um, go, go there. Uh, by the way, there is uh, survey.entelot.com. It's, it's totally free, but, but I hope you all will answer the short questionnaire. It helps Alt University to, to guide better people who are entering buildings. Right, um, next there is our first keynote presentation. Ah, yeah. Stuff funds, I'll, I'll try to find the presentation here. Everybody. Um, yes, smart city we are talking today and uh, already Kalle mentioned those uh, six uh, EU topics which are dominating the field, uh, at least in the EU frame, uh, those six topics which uh, were seen also in Kalle's slides. So uh, there are those six and they, I, I think they are very widely accepted, but of course it doesn't tell very much. There is uh, almost all, everything there on those slides. We can think that those people is more this individual characteristics and then living is our living environment. I noticed that governance was actually under living in Gala slides. This is a new idea in a way to put the governance under the living environment, which is a very discussable uh, uh, idea. Then this environment questions and mobility questions and, and, and finally smart economy. So this is something we agree on on EU level. Uh, but then my question uh, and what I like to open in this uh, presentation is the question what kind of urban planning? What does this mean uh, to urban planning this smart city? Which is a very wide and also confusing concept and uh, defined in very many ways. Uh, I come from Aalto University. It's a group uh, working uh, research and, and uh, degree teaching on, on urban planning, land use uh, questions, and it's uh, urban planning, we can say uh, the characteristics of urban planning is very much multidisciplinary. So that's a very everyday uh, environment for us to, to meet with the different people's, uh, people. And then uh, also, uh, the group has quite long, uh, already from the 60s, it has been giving also continuous uh, education to Finnish urban planners. So that makes that we have quite a good uh, network in the field of uh, urban planning and, and with the practice. My own background is uh, in, in urban planning. I'm an architect, uh, so not at all with technology to do, but somehow uh, now, now I find myself here and uh, the background is that uh, 
we have been working a lot with participatory methods. That is something we have been developing during the decades, how to involve people to the processes of urban planning, which are always very complex and they are very long. Uh, and that's the interaction and collaboration, because when you look at this, uh, our, some of those last uh, research projects uh, we have been running, what is the connection between them? It is, uh, between them, it is the collaboration and interaction which explains the, these kind of very separate tracks we have been working on. And also, all the time uh, with the research projects, we are working with a, uh, with a, light ne uh, with a wide network of, of uh, industry and uh, also, of course, uh, municipalities, which are very important when we talk about urban planning. Then, uh, some frame, uh, what, how do we understand uh, uh, this urban planning in, in the context of smart cities? So, we have some two very important presumptions here when I'm talking here. It is uh, the uh, commitment to participation and, and collaboration. And the other one is, of course, the ubiquitous uh, uh, digitalization, which is all over. And uh, on the other hand, planning is always a question of change. We are, it is intentional uh, operations, and we want to change our environment. We have an aim there. It's an interest. So, so it's an, there is a normative goal always when we talk about urban planning. But there, then between, we want to raise uh, some, we call it expanded urban planning, because urban planning is very strictly also uh, uh, in the le legislation in different countries uh, how it is uh, meant to do. It's very strongly institutional. But this smart city discussion opens the question of, of urban planning also and confuses the field quite a lot. And we can see that there is integration of this uh, urban planning, I mean now the institutional legislation uh, in urban planning, but also this urban development as covering the whole, uh, whole uh, smart city questions. And then we have this urban informatics, which is most, uh, mostly this institutional, but we also have this community informatics, which is this people uh, producing uh, knowledge, information in, in many ways. So the physical and real, all these, so you can see, I, I don't go into these uh, notions, but, uh, but you see that uh, the, what is happening in urban planning, so it's opening uh, very strongly in uh, its processes, not only the planning process which starts and ends, but the whole learning cycle uh, from visions to maintenance and then learning from that, that, uh, that what has been done and uh, seeing the impacts of urban planning and then, then again. Uh, making new visions. So this is very typical and uh, now in the uh, next slides I will concentrate on this is not a theory of urban planning concerning uh, smart city planning but it is some uh, framing of what is needed uh, as uh, far as we understand what is happening in the practice of urban planning at the moment. So the first thing is that that, that smart city it's uh, really produces a huge amount of data. All these fields, uh, for example, this in this EU frame, I like this picture very much. This is uh, one project I think Forum Virium has been doing, uh, participating in this uh, project, and this picture, how, how it is everywhere, the, the devices we are working on in our daily life, and uh, it produces that data we have to manage in urban planning. First is the big data. I know that this hall is full of people. You know much more about analyzing data. But this is something which is very uh, uh, repeatedly in our discussions, what to do with the open data and the big data, uh, which is very much about uh, when we talk about the new sources of, of information. And then we have the social media, which is challenging quite, quite heavily. Those uh, institutions of urban planning municipalities, they are quite... Uh, limited their, their appearance in social media, and, and this is one big question. Then we, are, we have these uh, very advanced methods uh, concerning our planning processes. This means that we, we are also doing in those planning processes, we are gathering data in many uh, also sophisticated ways. And then finally also people themselves, when being active citizens, they have, they have different methodology uh, methods. We have also been, in our research team, we have been active collaborating with NGOs, developing this kind of methods for collecting data for different kind of sources. 
So all this it produces. Somehow I, I see that ex, uh, it, there is an explosion of data when we talk, talk about urban planning. And uh, the question is how to, how to utilize that data in urban planning. Then we talk about knowledge creation and also, of course, knowledge management, which is the big challenge. That is, in a way, the, that is something we must uh, manage in the future more and more. Uh, is how to uh, bring that uh, data from different sources to the processes of urban planning. And that is something I think there is a lot to do in that because th that is in practice uh, what we have been seeing, that, uh, that there is very often a gap between those modeling and uh, different kind of analysis and those question, practical questions of, of planning, what shall we do in our environment, what kind of plans do we make. So this jumping over in a way the, the fine analysis and, and bringing it to the language uh, of, of, of planning is something where there is a lot to do. Uh, some pictures, uh, okay, we have those data banks which uh, every, each planner is uh, every day working with those data banks and, uh, and uh, data sources and uh, uh, trying to find ways of, of utilizing uh, uh, this, uh, these information sources. So these are some pictures we have been, uh, uh, our experiments in Otaniemi. We have the soft GIS, which Marketa Kutta with later today, uh, later today tell about this, uh, this method, how to, uh, the mo mobility maps, uh, which are, have been analyzed and then discussed with the stakeholders. Or uh, the next one, uh, construction. We, here in Otaniemi, we have a great field of change here. There is a new metro line coming here, and and uh, there is a huge pressure to, uh, to build more here, identify the urban structure here. And so it really gives a good uh, example for us uh, to collect empiria and, and involve ourselves to, to our own environment. And also here uh, we have been collecting uh, user data and, and then bringing that to the models, city models and building models uh, here in Otaniemi. And this is something we are working at the moment. Uh, and then we have this immersive experience, the space experience, that is one possibility uh, to, to open this discussion in the context of urban planning when we talk about smart cities. Uh, and then, of course, behind this modeling, we have this uh, where I, I know that your expertise also is. For example, agent-based modeling, we have been looking some of our researchers, how to, uh, what, what is the way to utilize, uh, what, what does this open, what kind of possibilities this, uh, for example, agent-based modeling uh, in, in the context of, uh, of urban planning. So, uh, for example, this, uh, this, the basic idea of understanding people's behavior uh, and uh, in the environment, so it's a very, I think it's very uh, inspiring uh, setting uh, for a method, but uh, those, uh, uh, research, uh, that research we have been uh, doing has also shown that there is all, uh, also a big gap between the, the, what kind of, how, in which form do we collect the data and how useful it is when we then go to the practical planning questions. So, so again, the same, same question of, of how to jump over the analysis to, to the practical planning, uh, planning situation. And then this just background pictures of, of this, uh, mo how to model this behavior in some uh, urban planning issues. And then uh, we have been looking at those possibilities. What does, uh, what does this agent-based modeling open in the context of urban planning? And then, of course, we have the big question of this uh, 3D models and, and city models, and for example, Helsinki Jarmo Suomesta has been you see, uh, sitting there, and uh, I know that Helsinki is very advanced in, in using this city, city models, and uh, this is from our Otaniemi area campus development, and there are those new, new uh, buildings uh, going to the very center. You can see the traffic change is already there. So, so uh, how to use these models in, in planning discussions is what we want to do, because there are wonderful models at the moment in, in each. I, I think the consulting offices and planning offices are really producing nice uh, models. But the question is that how to make them interactive, because they are very heavy models normally. And, and the challenge for to use them planning and is, is making changes and seeing different 
alternatives and this kind of interactive, uh, possi interactive possibility to, when using the model. So that's something which is needed in the practice and, and, and this is something we have been working on. Here there are next to, uh, some slides from MIT, which is uh, if you have visited MIT Media Lab, I think they have been uh, doing a wonderful job in this interactive modeling, uh, using partly this Lego uh, small pieces, but also then of course uh, uh, more digital tools. But the combination here is, is very clever in, in Media Lab's work. And then uh, cities, uh, this picture is from, from Rotterdam. Uh, it's very nice way of combining the traditional model and then, then some uh, uh, virtual uh, applications uh, which is interacting with the, with the model and, and also the, people, uh, the possibility for people to, to interact with the environment. For two weeks ago, uh, uh, weeks ago we had here Notan Emi 3D city, uh, city model hackathon and, and there were nine groups which were working during the whole weekend and producing different kind of ideas. How, do, how can we use the, the city, 3D city model uh, in, in practice? So, so that was uh, quite a good success, I, I think, that, that hackathon we, we had. Then we go further. Uh, what has, because of the complicated urban planning processes, we can see that very much our students are raising the question of system thinking. It somehow, it was, those who have seen 60s or 70s, it was very popular at that time when rationalism was, uh, was at its highest. But then, now again, there is maybe also the sustainability questions, which are very complex. Uh, they raise the question of, of system, the need for systems thinking and systems uh, understanding. And that is something which are, we are developing in our education to, to bring people together and, and try to understand what is the whole and, and uh, to get rid of these uh, uh, sub parts and, and optimization on, on too, too small scale. So, so this kind of uh, uh, a good example is, for example, here are the decisions which are made here in Otaniemi area concerning mobility during last 10 years. One of our researchers, researchers went through all those decisions of mobility planning in this one area during 10 years. So this is the map of that. So it's, it's really to understand what is happening in planning. It's a question to understand what is ongoing in the environment, what kind of processes are we running. And so, so it's really, the, the researcher made uh, interviews for decision makers. How do they understand when they make a, one uh, planning decision? How do they understand the, how the, it li its links to, to other ongoing projects? And, and the result was quite poor. It's, it's the decision makers, they, it's not very high. They understand. Of course, there are some key players who really widely understand it, but in general, the picture was not very good. And then we raised the question of the situation awareness. How, how do actually the decision makers understand what they are doing in, in the context of urban planning? And so we have been uh, developing some, uh, this is very, uh, very draft, uh, but for example, here in Otaniemi area, we have several projects ongoing and try to uh, collect information data from all those projects and try to make it visible, the timelines and, and the interactive models, and then also those project uh, sources, data sources uh, concerning uh, those uh, separate projects. So this kind of, uh, to help uh, those who are making decisions in other university, uh, but also in the, the city of Espo. So this is something uh, uh, which is needed. Uh, and it was interesting, I was uh, last July in MIT, there was a Kupung, which is uh, computers and urban planning and urban management. I don't know how many of you have been in Kupung sometime earlier. No one, but it's uh, already a 20, 20 years old conference and, and those people have been working uh, with uh, city modeling, modeling and analyzing and modeling for decades. And the big question in that I was a bit surprised in that conference was that all those planning uh, and decision support systems, because now technology is advanced uh, enough 
that there are also these practical uh, possibilities for using these models. And now they are in the stage in that uh, discipline that uh, it opens possibilities for, for linking uh, those results and technology uh, to practice. And that was a big discussion, participation and this uh, decision and, and planning support systems. So, so this, is, uh, this links to that question. And then finally, we have the question of collaboration. The more we have st uh, stakeholders, the more we have different disciplines, the more we have the need for collaboration. And that is something we, we try to teach for our students from the very beginning when they start here. Uh, and uh, it, it's, you, you can't uh, uh, too much emphasize this question of, of collaboration. So it's meeting and discussing. Uh, it is uh, actually those sustainability uh, issues which has really, once again, uh, taking this, uh, this uh, question of, of this need for discussions and, and valuing, because otherwise we are somehow, we are drunken in, uh, uh, oh, how do you say, uh, hukua. Drown. Drown, okay, in, uh, in that data, if we don't value the, the, the uh, different sources and, and analyses we, we have on the table when, when making plans. This picture is from, from uh, Otaniemi stakeholders. Uh, we have developed uh, methods for serving uh, the, the stakeholders to come together uh, here in Otaniemi, uh, the land, landowners and, and university and the city and, and residents and, and these pictures are from that. And then again, we come to these, me uh, these tools which we have. We have the models, we have the very classical tools, but then we of course have these MIT very advanced tools. But, but this uh, coming together situation, they must be served, facilitated with interactive smart planning tools. So now we have this frame here, and then I have some final, some final pictures. Uh, most of my pictures here are from our one pilot development we have been doing here in, in the School of Engineering. There is the Marine Technology, Cruise and Ferry Group, and our Land Use Planning Group who have been uh, make, made the initiative, uh, and the Dean has been uh, funding, funding that uh, pilot project, and it's called R, the Built Environment Lab, which is this uh, combination of, of, of this cave idea and then, then this decision support which makes the environment a bit difficult than, uh, than uh, the normal cave environments. The way how, how we have done it is that we are having those big research projects ongoing and in each of them we have tried to find ways to collaborate and take advantage of this uh, new environment, which we can say that it's co collaborative uh, planning, but uh, uh, digitally uh, supported. And these are those topics I have already mentioned here, situation awareness and the working with city models and, and the gamification comes very strongly from young researchers, their interest towards gamification. And then again, the, the way how, how we are working, it's, uh, it's uh, understanding the complex uh, processes and then emphasizing multidisciplinary working and, and participation. And then there's some key research concepts uh, like user experience, which is very near our in research interest. And this knowledge mashup and, and visualizations to support planning and decision making. So our environment, it's a, it's a combination of, of this. We have, a, in Finland, in several cities already, we have these cave environments where there is this possibility to experience the space. Uh, but then what we made a lot before uh, uh, building this, uh, this environment, we made quite a large interview uh, in the field uh, practice of urban planning, and very strongly they raised also those uh, uh, urban planners this question of, of supporting decision making. And that's why the, the environment is a combination of, of this. It, it works as an immersive environment, but also it is a more open, open, uh, way of, uh, open screen, three parts in it, and it, it serves very well when bringing different 
uh, data on the screen and, and uh, uh, so making, uh, supporting and facilitating uh, the discussion with the people in that room. So all these, most of these pictures you have been seeing here, there is also the lightning, smart, uh, smart lightning, some experiments done that, and, and Gruis and Ferry uh, interior design uh, tools. And this, this kind of, uh, during the two last years, we have been making this kind of uh, demos in these research projects we have been running. And, and uh, at the moment, we are in the situation that we, are, we want to establish in some Finnish cities this kind of same kind of environment and collaborate uh, with them and build that kind of network of this, this kind of uh, room or space, how do you call it, hub, whatever platform, there are several words for that, but, but the idea is that together with the cities uh, develop uh, this way of working in, in future planning projects. And we have seen that also companies are, are interested in bringing their uh, bring the technology to be tested and, and integrated to this environment. So here are our professors looking at the, the screen and, and also some children we have been inviting uh, during the Expo Day. So, thank you. So we are actually from DDD. Just uh, if I could give the full screen, maybe. Um, okay. Just your, yeah, okay, thank you. So this is more a bit, uh, actually, I mean, I just noticed that we have really similar topics with, with Aya, so thank you for your excellent presentation. I just have a different angle of, of uh, uh, talking about it, but really the same terminology, so it was nice to hear your presentation. Oh, this is, okay, now. Right, so um, of course we all know these drivers of change. I mean, there's digitalizations, aging society, lack of resources, climate change, everything. So that is kind of like the, the driver why we need to change and why we need to actually do the build the, the smart cities in order to really uh, save the, the, uh, the globe and, and our cities for the future. And, uh, and uh, this is also why we have been working with the, with the roadmaps. Uh, with, with several different roadmaps. So this just shows you a few examples what we have been doing for the, for the European Commission, but, but also for the Finnish government and, and for the Nordic technology uh, innovation platforms. And actually coming there is this um, uh, ICT roadmaps for smart cities, which actually Maris is leading currently, and she's giving the, the talk later on. And also the CIP roadmap, uh, which is published on, the, on, on smart cities, and that will be published next. Uh, uh, next summer, actually in, in Finland, in, in Tampere. Right, but, but basically, I mean, then, then why, why cities? What not, what, what, why not only the, the kind of like the nations or kind of like European wide perspectives? It's actually because, I mean, cities are the core of the innovation and core of the, the energy use also. Actually, like 90% of, the, of the, all the innovations are done in the cities. So cities are kind of like crucial uh, places where we could make a big change. And also at the same time, I mean cities, when, while they are using so much energy and they have less resources all the time, so kind of like how they do the transformation, so that their only options is to do that in, in a smart way. Uh, then of course what makes a city smart? It is the balance between the economic perspective, uh, the social perspectives and the environmental perspectives. So all those need to be balanced, otherwise it's kind of like sub-optimization of, of something. Uh, it, it won't work if, if not the, all those uh, things are in balance. And the technology is actually only the combining factor there for, the, for to make the, the cities to work. Then, as Aya was mentioning, so the systemic thinking is, is really coming there. And here, actually, what we see is, is quite crucial, and, and we are developing different concepts, especially understanding how, how cities are connected, how the subsystems are connected, what are the consequences if I make some change here, what are the consequences to next system, next subsystem, sub-sub-sub-subsystems, and, and everything. So this is, this is actually 
really tricky and it's also because I mean this is not only kind of like technical changes but also like user changes, behavior changes, how they are affecting in the long term and also in the short term and how we can forecast the, the systems and, and optimize their performance in, in, in real life. Uh, if we take for example uh, an example of, of uh, energy. We know that the energy system is now changing. We have more and more fluctuating power for solar and, and wind energy. So it's not anymore the sta stable power what we have there. And we need to of course adapt to those, those powers that we, we can use them maximally and, and well, well good. And, and then also another thing why those are actually uh, increasing more and more those fluctuation power is of course because we have new, new technologies to produce the, the power. This just shows an example of PV panel, what is printed in, in Otaniemi, uh, sorry not Otaniemi but in all VTT. So you can see that it's flexible, it's easy to install and since it's printed so it's much more cheaper than, than the typical, typical one. And since it will be then uh, cheaper, so of course, I mean, this gives us, us a new possibilities to, to, to capture the energy even from in, inside buildings, like from the lighting and, and those kind of things. So kind of like uh, totally new, new, new ideas and new ways to, to utilize the PV and, and energy also inside buildings uh, will, will create us new opportunities. But then, I mean, then the tricky thing is that in the, on the demand side then, uh, if you think about the demand side, so we, we know quite easily that we can reduce the energy consumption quite easily 50 or even 80 percent. So totally, meaning total the whole year energy consumption. But if we then think about the peak power demand, so at, at the same time when we are reducing the energy consumption to half or even more, so we can reduce the peak only by 20 percent. And that is kind of like the tricky thing, that we, we need some intelligent systems in order to reduce the peak amount much more. Because I mean, with the traditional means, we can only reduce it by 20%. And that's not enough if we, if we think that we need to have the energy system functioning where the power supply is uh, so, so fluctuating and, and so unstable. So we need advanced intelligent systems there as well. And that's of course why we are speaking so much about the future energy networks, about the smart grids, about energy storages, about the energy management, about the uh, changing value chains in the whole energy sector. So this is of course why everyone is, is so excited about that. Um, th this is why we have also been doing quite a lot of research together with, with our partners about the, how we then optimize the, the data from different sources, how to make new business models, models of, of that, how to aggregate the data and, and how to make it easy to use with, with different toolbox. And of course be, behind that we have a lot of data about the, from the smart meters, about the data, how we mine the data, what type of typologies we have there, what kind of profile, different tro profile we can find there, how we can use them best possible way in order to, to optimize the, the whole system. Um, then at the same time, I mean, uh, we have, uh, as, as the energy consumption is changing, also that, that gives us the new challenges for the existing networks. How we use them in the best possible way, in a way that we can use the existing infrastructure, what we have, and especially, I mean, in the Nordic countries, we have really good infrastructures already. So how we can utilize that even more, more and, and make the advanced more based on the existing networks, how we can use them uh, together with renewables, how we can uh, use them in, in the best possible way in the urban planning, where we should put the new buildings, how we should create the infill areas and, and how, how we are using the existing network. So that is kind of like the, uh, and of course, how we are running the, the existing networks. And, and this is why we have actually been uh, working quite a lot about the modeling system. And, and we, are, we have been developing over 20 years this kind of black model, which is called EPROS. 
And that is based on the model which, which has the networks, so different energy networks, but also like the building, building models. And inside the building models, we have also like the behavior models, so how people are behaving and we can change those. And then actually like individual changes in behavior, so we can see that in the long run also in the network side. And kind of like to estimate that, well, if this trend is going now on that way, so how does it mean for our energy system? How, 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 what, what is the, the effect on the building system and how, how we should best possible way optimize it? And that is of course really powerful tool for, for understanding the, the systemic way of, of working. And for example, uh, what are the changes if they are increasing electrical cars in our networks and, and supplying the power in, in the dwellings and in the apartment buildings. Um, then a few examples about the uh, city development. This is one, one example of a city where this uh, dark area is, is kind of like um, infill area where we, the, the question was that, well, what kind of energy sources we should use? Should we use the lake there or should we use the, uh, the solar power or how we should combine or district heating? And, and also like what level we should use the insulation in the buildings, how much technologies and, and demand side management in the buildings should be, should be there. And where is the optimization between the primary energy use, the economic performance, and, and also of course the, the investment there. And, and then we kind of like, I mean, the, the nice, uh, Nice, uh, nice uh, result here was that actually, I mean, depending on the, of course, on the on the primary energy source, but also on the on the on the control uh, of of the system. So you can see a huge differences. Even though I mean, kind of like the the lowest one can be the three times lower than the highest one in CO2 emissions, only because of the control logs and control systems. Highlighting really that the intelligence uh, systems are really important for, for energy management. Um, then um, in the same project, we were not uh, only uh, focusing on the energy, but also like that how we create the, the, the whole area. And this is actually what, what Aya was just explaining. So, so, we, so we used actually this kind of like work, working, work, uh, working methods with the like integ integration, like uh, having the visualization of the area. Would you prefer this type of building or that type of building? What kind of colors would you prefer? And also kind of like augmented reality they're kind of like that you can see your screen that well now this is like he here in, in reality but if we put the buildings here would you prefer on this way or on that way and kind of like to to have a most realistic picture for the for the coming 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 um, inhabitants there and and of course i mean that's the, that's then how we use them in the in the city planning and, and building goes later on um, the the augmented reality, I mean, it's not only in the urban planning where we are using that, but it's also in the, in the building maintenance. So the, we have good possibilities when we have the building information already existing in the building. So how we can see then that where are the piping lines or the electricity lines. So the maintenance people, they can easily locate the places and, and, and kind of like to see that, well, the, the problem might be there or there and not kind of like need to repair the whole um, whole uh, false ceiling, for example. And, and then um, in the building level performance, so it's quite, quite uh, obvious that we can, of course, visualize the measurements. So what is the performance? What is the, what is the temperature uh, or, or air quality there in, inside in the building? How we visualize that in, in, in an easy way for users to understand and then, of course, for the for the maintenance people to locate that, well, these are performing, this part of the buildings is performing well, this part is, is not performing that well. Um, then uh, one really nice pilot is this, um, this forecasting self-learning buildings, where we actually try to not only to to kind of like optimize the energy system, but also like to forecast the, the system. So we are basically combining the, the weather forecast information for the automatic system and, and also like uh, combining the user behaviors on the forecasting system. So kind of like that, 
yesterday the people were coming on this and this ways and, and well probably today they are maybe going on that and that way and, and by that optimize the ventilation uh, for the lighting and, and those kind of things and uh, also like the electrical car charging uh, how we how we use the storages in, in that building so that gives uh, has, has saved quite a lot of uh, like capacity and how much capacity we need to build on, on the building level and then even, even more, uh, more important is, of course, to understand not only the user preferences, what kind of like colors they like to have in, in the buildings, but also like what kind of comfort levels they, they wish to have in, in, their, in their buildings. And currently we are uh, quite a lot, our systems are controlling the temperature inside the building based on the tem air temperature inside the buildings, typically 21 degrees of, of Celsius. But now we have developed this kind of a human thermal model, which takes much more um, um, precisely into account the kind of like what are the differences and preferences between the head and, and your tone, toe about the temperatures and air movements and, and, and kind of like what kind of clothing you have in, on top of you. And based on, on that actually, if we control instead of that 21 degrees, so if we control based on that thermal model, our, our air, air temperature, so, so the so the users' uh, well-being rises, so they are more comfortable, so they tend to like the, the environment much more. And actually, during the heating, heating season, we can roughly save energy 20%, and in the cooling season, which is actually e even, even more practical, so we can save up to 30% of the energy. So that's kind of like really remarkable, just based on the different con control strategies. So it shows really the, the importance. Uh, for, for, the, for the user's understanding and, and, the, and the human body understanding. Uh, while we are so interested about the, the control and, and, and management of, of the building, so of course we are interested about the sensors. And uh, we are running in, in VTT this uh, Pro-IoT program, which is focusing on the, on the, on the, on the data and, and sensors and of course how we, how we manage the data. So here we are um, uh, developing sensors that if we have one sensor, so why the sensor cannot like have many function and communicate with other sensors in order to optimize that we are not installing as we are today many sensors metering actually the same thing but because they are connected to different systems so they cannot com communicate together. So kind of like that, that, that is one where we are more and more doing, doing um, especially related to lighting and how light bulbs can communicate further the information to other light bulbs uh, and optimize the lighting inside the buildings. Another really uh, important uh, focus is, is also, also the people flows and, and people tracking. So how we know that where people are moving, how they are moving. This is really important, not only for the urban planning, of course for the urban planning is extremely important and, and for the mobility planning, but also like inside, for example, shopping centers, what kind of uh, facilities or, or shops we should locate there and what, what on the other places. In case of emergency, what are the crucial roads there? What are the possible um, problem places in, in the building? So kind of like that we can, we know the, the, where the people are moving and also we, we know better for the planning then that we can design it in a much more uh, functional way. Then, then in the in this transportation, of course, I mean how, how cars are communicating. Uh, between cars that they are more safe and, and the distance, distance stays there, but also like the weather information and the icing of the roads and those kind of like rather simple information, but to, to communicate that to the driver and to the cars. Too. So that has, uh, of course, uh, quite a lot of safety, safety and performance um, benefits. And then, uh, as, as Aya was saying, so the data exists everywhere. Uh, we, we know that there is a, a lot of data, and actually it's not a lack of data, but it's, it's lack of the quality of the data and also the format of the data. It's no point that we have data, but I mean we don't have the de devices how to use the data because different uh, technologies use different uh, data formats and, and it's, it's not, not readable for, for other formats. So that is really crucial for us. And of course, I mean, even though if we can read the data, so, but how we can create uh, from the data to really information which, which is then supporting the, the decision uh, making and ultimate targets in, in the cities. 
And, and here are a, a few examples about this uh, combining different data so of, of different layers. We did one example in, in France uh, with the electrical networks to combine the, the measurement data from the networks when the networks went down due to some pro uh, weather problems and combining that data to social media data to locate the better and quicker the, the place where, the, where that, uh, that uh, problem exists. So we could locate the, the problem place much quicker and also we could send the feedback for the users that well, we have located the, the problem and we are ex ex expecting that in 30 minutes you get back your electricity. Those kind of like uh, rather easy and, and simple, simple things but, uh, but creates much more benefits not only for the electrical company but also, also for the users. And another um, example of, of that is in what we did in, in Central Europe uh, about the uh, fireman, firemen and, and the data for, from different buildings. Because when the firemen, when they are entering to the house which is burning, so they need to, of course, I mean, they need to know uh, where the people are, what type of people there are in order to save them uh, uh, as, as, a, as fast as possible, but also that they need to know that they are also by themselves safe, that there is no like aggressive people or something. And, and, and also be, uh, sometimes when you have kids or some disabled people, so they might react when they panic, so they might go, go and hide under the bed or in the carpet or somewhere. So they need to know that if there is some risk that they need to seek people inside the building. So we, we, what we did is that, um, because on the privacy issues, of course, you cannot point that, well, these, these, the, the, that kind of people are living there, but we have like color mark that, well, these are green, so kind of like typical people, these are like uh, purple, so this is kind of like kids are living here, and, or elderly people are living here, that the, the firefighters really know exactly when they are driving to the, to the building that, well, these are the kind of like the structure of the, of the building, these are the type of the people who are living there, and of course the, that result is much more effective rescue uh, in the building. Um, and then another other, uh, other part of, of, uh, of information uh, from the technical perspective, I mean, we have many many subsystems in the building, for example, energy or, or mobility or, or, uh, or other systems in, in the building. So how we combine the data, is it the open data or closed data, but at least to have the interfaces for, for the data in order to make new services. Because, I mean, combining the data makes the, the new services, not only the traditional silo-based silo data, but really combining the data. Uh, especially with totally extreme domains, so that, that creates us the, the new possibilities for new, new services for both the government and, and citizens and, and industry. Uh, one example of, of running um, Horizon 2020 pro project about the um, performance indicators in, in, inside the city, so how you can point the different areas or, or different locations in the city, first see then the big picture about the performance that, well, what is the roughly the area and then go deep detail, detail in the building level and even in the, in the room level uh, to, to see the different performances there inside the building. And, and for the fur further reading, so there is, um, this is a free publication, so it's, it's free to round, download for all of you if you are interested in what we have done in the, in the previous projects. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to speak about public procurement. Such a fascinating topic, isn't it? <laughs> Less about planning, but more about actually how to take new smart city solutions on the market by using the demand of the public procurers, mostly cities, other city authorities, and, and creating some hopefully lead market for, for new solutions. Um, so um, we've seen a couple of uh, distinctions about what smart city is about, and this is another one not created by us, but by one of the, the smart city vendors so to speak. Uh, but my message here is that there's a lot of things um, taking place in the city environment 
where there's a, lots of different players. There are consumers, there are companies, um, and there are public authorities. Uh, but in many of these, sort of, so to speak, uh, sectors and market areas, the public procurer, or let's say the city as a, as a, as a buyer, is, is using a lot of money to, to buy different services, different goods, different technology, different IT solutions, and so forth. So they are big buyers of, of lots of things. And, and now the question is, can we use that purchasing power more smartly to pull all those wonderful technologies and all those wonderful services and, and products that companies are developing? Possibly also citizens are developing. Sometimes even third sector is developing. And sometimes public sector themselves is developing. But mostly for the companies. How can we, we pull those, those things on the, on, on the implementation side and create some marketplace? So if you look at uh, areas of, of, of a smart city, we can find that, that in different degrees, the, the city governments and public administrations are, are big buyers of, of different things. So that's the starting point. Um, so the power of this public purse, um, there's large procurement budgets uh, within uh, cities. For instance, the city of Helsinki um, has a loan 2 billion euros purchasing budget per year. And that's a lot of money. If we can use part of that, even tiny bit of that money, to, to, to buy new products, new solutions, that would be a very much, uh, very big um, demand for, for new innovation. Um, but not only the, 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 the simple amount, some of that big money uh, will not be spent on that so smartly. It's, it's been allocated to things that, and contracts that are ongoing and, and there's not so much room for. But I'm convinced that the most, let's say, um, there's a room for smart city solutions in, in very large degree of those, those purchases over, over a longer uh, period of time. Um, and these, are, these can be found in, in transportation, urban infrastructure development, energy, water, sanitation, waste services, and so forth. Um, but also, not only because the city is the user, but also because they can catalyze in some special occasions also the private sector usage to be a sort of catalytic a player. And uh, we've heard already from the previous speakers that, that smart city is very much about systems and even systems of systems. So there's a lot of dependencies and, and often when we look at these, these new smart city uh, solutions, there's a sort of a chicken and egg problem that, that it's very difficult to, to create the supply of, of these services before there's demand for the services. But at the same time, the demand doesn't take off before there's a supply. So how can we solve that problem? And so we are making a hypothesis on the basis of previous uh, experiences that we've been studying that, that public procurement can play a sort of catalytic role uh, to kickstart the, the market by, by putting some money on the value chain and getting things running. So um, not only technology push, but also demand pull. And these are not optional that we would replace um, the traditional R&D projects and, and different types of research uh, activities and also the, the, the R&D activities by procurement. That's not the, the issue here. It's more about complementing what is already happening and, and, and close the gap in, in, in some, some occasions where new products can be taken to the market. Uh, when we talk about procurement, there's different varieties. There's not one single solution how to do procurement of innovative solutions. We need to look at across different types of uh, uh, approaches we need to analyze the situation, what we want to buy, and, and what is the, also the, 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 the market situation to start with. If you look at the sort of conventional way to buy things, 
especially with the public sector. You would do a market analysis, you would make a call for tenders and procure some things and then enter in the contract. Um, when you want to buy something uh, that is already on the marketplace but doesn't have a long re reference of implementations, and that is often the hurdle with, with new innovation that the companies who are commercializing them, uh, they, they have a hard time finding the first buyer who takes a little bit of risk and, 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 and buys the, the first time these uh, new solutions. So um, this is the case where you would look at the, the, the first buyer, sort of reference implementation buyer, and typically uh, it would take place through using of, of uh, functional specification, which means basically that, that you specify what the solution should be doing, not how it should uh, do, its, do its work. So performance-based, functional-based, maybe life-cycle-based, there's many, many different varieties of that, but that's, that's the way to, to do it in, 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 in many occasions. Um, but then we have something which is quite interesting, especially when we're talking about, uh, about new solutions that involve uh, technological development, uh, research work, especially when we are dealing with hardware, uh, the product development cycle is quite long. So it's difficult to match with a typical procurement cycle that, okay, we make a call for tenders for, for new solutions and, and please uh, develop it for us on the spot, so to speak. But we need to give some time to, for the companies to do, to do the product development. And one way to do is to, to communicate the needs quite early on to the marketplace that these are the needs that we will want to buy in the, in the future. Um, we will give you some time before we, we will start making any, any, any procurements. So sort of our early, early communication of needs that hopefully will for, uh, trigger innovation. Then there's the last variety, and, and this, is, this list is not exhaustive, it's just a sort of uh, trying to show you the, the, some of the, some of the um, uh, varieties of, of these, these approaches is really to, to, to procure the development, the product development of a new solution. And this is the sort of process that, that you would hear uh, referred to as pre-commercial procurement, the PCP model that especially the European Commission at, at the moment is quite, quite forcefully pushing forward. And uh, the trick here is that, that after you communicate your needs, you actually make a contract with companies that they will develop the solution that you're looking for. But not only with one company, but several companies simultaneously. So you will create competition. There are there's quite many uh, projects in the European space already financed by, by the European Commission, um, which, which are very interesting, very promising, uh, but I would say that they, they seem to take uh, quite a long time to, to develop because there are many partners involved, many countries involved. So I will give you another example that we are currently working on, and, uh, and it, it's a work in process uh, with the city of Tampere. We've been assisting them with, with making a, a, a one type of pre-commercial procurement to, to develop a supply of, of services and solutions for real-time traffic information. So basically the city wants to know what's happening in the in, in the traffic within, the, within their boundaries, whether it's dealing with, with public transportation, uh, road transport, uh, the rail, and so forth. And, and uh, um, it's, it's first of all, they, they want to, to increase their situation awareness, what is happening around there. Um, secondly, they, they, they try to enable that development by opening public data, which is also a development that has been very, very much uh, done here in, in Helsinki region. Um, and, and one of the, the beauties of this, this, uh, this development is that, that the vision is not to, 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 to procure one single system that would have maybe multi-million multi euro price tag, but rather to, to see 
a system of, of complementary solutions to emerge on the marketplace that at later stage can be complemented with each other. Um, so that we would enable the third party developers to create new services. So what we created is a two-stage pre-commercial procurement process and uh, the call for tenders has been now just closed and it seems quite promising. Naturally, not much can be said about the content, but, but uh, there were uh, quite many uh, suppliers suggesting the, the, the product concepts there and, and it it's, it's quite, looks quite, quite promising that this kind of process can, can give us some good results. So what is the outcome of this kind of approach is, is not really uh, procurement of operational system yet. It's rather procuring the service prototypes that will be piloted with the users. And this should be quite interesting for the companies that they will uh, get a contract to develop a product for themselves, which will be piloted with the real users. And essential thing, essential thing here is that, that the IPR the intellectual property will stay with the company. So they will have a possibility to commercialize uh, this solution to, to other clients, to other cities, uh, but also to export markets. And this is also one of the requirements that has been built in this procurement, that, that uh, the, the companies need to demonstrate that there is a business case beyond the city of Tampere. Tampere doesn't want a solution that is tailor-made for them but rather something that can be replicated, can be scaled up, and eventually to, to, to ignite a market development. And a very similar procurement is now under planning in Helsinki. So what we are, uh, what we are hoping is that there will be several buyers, several vendors creating a marketplace which, which will uh, sort of create a, a smart uh, mobility, uh, smart uh, traffic information uh, sort of ecosystem here, here in Finland and beyond. Um, and this is the process how it's been structured. Um, so as you can see, there are multiple firms competing, first making concept proposals, then concept prototypes, and then finally the best ones will, will go to the last stage, which is the pilot. And, and the, the city will uh, make an R&D contract, R&D procurement with these companies to to develop those prototypes and, and do the pilots. So that's just an example um, of, of how to do innovation procurement in the smart city space. Um, then I would like to fi finalize a couple of words about uh, another aspect that is related to what I've been speaking so far, but I think is a really a, a big, big topic and, and also a great opportunity for, for the collaboration between Helsinki and Tallinn. Uh, it has to do with the, the issue of interoperability, how to make all these wonderful solutions to, to, to work together, um, not only in, in technical terms, but also in, in institutional terms. Um, and we have a, one project uh, with the title Intercity, now ongoing, financed by Tekes, where we are uh, looking into the practices, um, how the cities can cities and companies can, can, can work together to, to create the, the sort of practices that support interoperability uh, developing in, in smart city solutions. We are looking at uh, the transport sector, but also other sectors like, like the, the 3D city models is one case we are, we are currently looking into and, and, and several others also in the energy, energy field and so forth. But if we look at the, the big picture where we have the, the sort of ICT architecture on the bottom, and we have a business ecosystem where there are companies developing new uh, compatible systems together. But there's also the, the, uh, the, the, the tools that the cities themselves and the public sector uh, have. And, and one of the, the, the issues that we believe can make a difference here is, is whether the cities will put the interoperability as one requirement in, in the tenders that when they are purchasing new, new, new uh, systems. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's something that alone will not make the day here, but it can be a critical uh, way to, to sort of direct the market into, uh, into a mode 
where not only tailor-made integrated vertical solutions are purchased, which quite often create this kind of vendor lock-in, which is very, very, very familiar to most of the people who are working with the IT systems, but more sort of horizontally layered, layered system, which has a capacity to scale up to, to international markets. And, and this is the vision that, that we've, we've created, that over the, the coming years, we would find a way to, to move towards a situation where we have multiple cities, other uh, organizations procuring new, new, new solutions, new products, end users, these could be consumers or companies, and different types of vendors, service providers, application developers, to create a sort of ecosystem where there's room for different types of players. And, and personally, I believe that if we really want to create opportunities for uh, small and medium-sized companies, we need something like this to, 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 to provide them other options than, than partnering only with uh, the large, large vendors, but also to, to, to develop sort of modular systems that can be uh, scaled up. So finally, this is my last slide, few, few items about um, uh, public procurement of innovation. Um, as I said, as I started in the beginning, there's, there's many ways, many approaches to uh, how, how we can do uh, procurement for the city uh, where the target is to purchase not only what has been on the marketplace for a long time, but, but new innovative solutions. <coughs> <coughs> but in order to select the right approach, and as I said, there are quite many, and uh, this pre-commercial approach which I showed you is only one among many. <coughs> I think there are four, at least four, four key issues we need to consider. First, uh, we need to consider what is the sort of um, supply market readiness to offer some, some new products, new solutions. In some cases, if the city has a challenge which is unsolved, sometimes you will find, if you look hard enough, you will find solutions on the marketplace. And that puts you in one, one position. Another position is when you have many potential products but they haven't yet tested, they haven't yet proved that it really works. So that would lead us more to the sort of piloting uh, uh, type uh, approaches which enable piloting. And then we have um, the kind of readiness level where there's a need from the city, but not yet much on the marketplace, which would take us to the sort of a pre-commercial type of approach or other other type of approach where product development still needs to take place. Secondly, there's a timeline of product development. In some cases, we, we find that there's a, maybe an app or, or a service or a simple integration issue where the, the new innovation actually can take place within the procurement that the city is making. But in other cases, the innovation that you're looking for is really taking much longer time because it involves uh, complex technical development or some, some hard integration issues. And again, you would uh, need to select another type of approach uh, depending on what time, timeline are you looking for. And thirdly, whether you are trying to, whether your aim is to buy an integrated solution or you want to buy the pieces that, that will uh, create the, 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 the actual solution, so sort of modular parts based uh, purchasing. And then finally, some consideration how to scale up and, and, and provide the IPR. Does it stay with the buyer or, or would you allow the companies to utilize it? There's not a simple answer to these questions, but, but some issues to consider. Thank you. as well as uh, efficient energy use uh, 
how to store energy, how to, uh, as Mimo was talking about, always and showing figures and examples about balancing energy systems, but, uh, using energy flexibility to improve the overall efficiency and re reduce the energy load peaks. So energy balancing comes there, and for that we need smart energy management systems and holistic coordination of the system. To, and as a final target to get the energy system in, a, in cities to op operate uh, as co like well as sustainable as coordinatedly as possible and um, here we have a map of different kind of future developments that is envisaged in at the moment so um, for for example the energy efficiency in buildings is uh, improving, for example, due to nearly zero energy and zero energy developments that are ongoing, and then um, <coughs> that will create changes to the energy demand profiles. That and uh, buildings will become sort of prosumers, so that they also produce on-site energy. Uh, then. When currently energy is produced on a mainly on a centralized way from large, large uh, energy production plants, the uh, future trend seems to be that increasingly the distributed energy production is uh, well coming more and more common, common, and the energy comes from different sources, and this creates a like challenge how to how to coordinate, how to op optimize this energy mix, how to use it in the best possible way, most efficiently. And with uh, as small Im impacts as possible, like, I mean, environmental impacts. Uh, then mm, another development uh, that is seen in the future is like now when the energy production is centralized, the energy is distributed, distributed usually like one way from the energy production plants to end users of the energy. But in the future, it is seen that it will uh, become as other smart city aspects as well, like so that the, like the, both the communication and energy flows will go to two ways. So, so also from the uh, energy users and buildings they are, it is seen that their role will become uh, more active as a part of the energy system. And then the uh, planning of energy systems. Now, it's another thing that is like the development trends is towards more optimized holistic planning and so that energy planning won't happen like on a separate aspect totally, but it would be uh, already linked to the urban planning, really like early, <laughs> early in the urban development and the transportation and waste and management systems and try to find the like different synergy effects with integrating different city systems and infrastructures. And what it, what is all targets to is to get optimal, optimally coordinated optimally working uh, energy system that is as sustainable as possible. And uh, as Mimo already well, said earlier, refer to we have been um, creating in a EU project a a roadmap for energy systems in smart cities and especially focusing on ICT development needs and ICT innovations that should be done. And uh, in the road mapping work related to energy systems, we have identified four main stakeholder groups, so the citizens, building sector, energy sector and municipality. And that was the sort of base ground or basic classification for starting to build the roadmap and think that well, how ICT could support future energy systems. 
So we see that citizens' role is to become, well, they are becoming prosumers more ac and like more actively participating to the energy systems and ICT could offer ways, new ways to collaborate and uh, well, increase participation. And on the other hand, citizens, what do they get from this? So the aim is that they would get new services, more comfortable living environment, and uh, economical benefits. Uh, related to building sector, it's, well, it's basically about buildings becoming more energy efficient and how to, how to manage that, that uh, in the best way. And from the energy sector point of view, then of course, that how to manage the energy system, energy products on energy, supl energy supply. And uh, with municipality has all links to all of this and the like, collaboration and the communication is needed a lot. And now the uh, rest of the presentation, I'm focusing on these two uh, first ones. So the citizens and building sector abroad, as I was asked to talk about energy trading and prosumers specifically. So what is an energy prosumer? It is an energy consumer that is also producing energy on site. This is just a, I'm not sure whether it's it really a like, well, at the European level, many, many people have accept, at least accepted this definition at, and are talking about prosumers, at, but in some way it, it is sort of like, um, well, when people are talking about, for example, nearly zero energy buildings, zero energy buildings and plus energy buildings, this is quite commonly used term. And nowadays, what we could call as an, like electricity prosumers and uh, companies serving electricity prosumer services in Finland, um, there are some already existing. For example, first ones that came to my mind was Fortum and Helen that actually have turnkey-based services for energy uh, trading or prosumers trading energy. With, and it includes procuring the, uh, the solar panels and installing them and taking care of the management of it. And in the end, the energy company is also buying the energy. And then there are, of course, like uh, some electricity companies, in Finland, electricity distribution companies, I mean, that already allow this kind of business models already so that they. Um, enable energy trading and uh, uh, have offered the opportunity that they can buy electricity that is, boy, uh, that is produced on site, for example, in buildings or other small distributed energy production units. And um, then, well, if that is the state of the art and that's where we are now, then one of the uh, roadmap topics that I was referring to or telling earlier was related to energy trading and brokering. And here the focus is especially on how ICT could enable it, how, to, how ICT could support and make, make it to work more efficiently. And um, uh, well, the state of the art, but just to, I'm not going to go this in detail. This is all open material and there are links in my presentation to those who are more interested about details. But um, as state of the art, state of the art, the, there are some ICT solutions for improved energy management and that those, those are really needed to to realize to start making the energy trading. And um, 
uh, in the short term, we need better systems and protocols for the communication and also for the energy balancing and how to, how to take care of the load variations and so on. And the, actually energy brokering could be also like one, uh, one part of that big puzzle and it could support it, but then if it's not created or done wisely, it can make it energy balancing also a lot harder. And uh, there are, for example, quest, uh, development points related to energy management and energy tariffs with different price levels and what kind of appliances are needed to utilize and take care of these. And the final vision is, is again to get the like, optimal energy uh, supply and use with that is as sustainable or with as small and uh, environmental impacts and uh, getting the like the economical approach, approach as good as possible. And this actually also helped to like increase the share of renewable energy sources use in the energy system. And what, what does this energy trading then means from the district per, per perspective is that um, there's, well, there's research ongoing about neighborhood energy tradings. There are actually several EU projects, for example, ongoing currently. And how energy trading could, what is its role from the district perspective and from the energy company's perspective, how to mm, match energy supply and demand in the best way. In both in buildings and then regarding the district neighborhood or district or neighborhood energy systems. And for that, we have been thinking of different kind of, uh, well, visualizations and modeling simulation approaches, how this topic could be studied. And Um, from the district point of view, we can, uh, with energy matching, with energy trading, we can reduce primary energy use, reduce emissions, and reduce distribution losses of energy. And then, uh, well, again, we are talking about what, how to develop data processing methods, what kind of tools are needed for it how to uh, provide or how to develop integration and communication between existing tools and databases, different kind of data formats as there has been already been discussions about today. And yeah, so in the end, the requirements or needs for like different kind of tools, both for the planning phase, but also for the operation phase and the impact assessment and collaboration. The platforms and they, those are developed for example in this design for energy project so if you are interested to learn more I have links in my presentation so you can find it and then uh, about looking towards future what is um, well sort of the earlier on currently energy trading it's about electricity trading only or usually because electricity trading and distribution is a lot easier more flexible but while talking about thermal energy heat or cooling energy trading they are local products and cannot be distributed very long trips so it's like only inside of the city usually and then this came to my mind this is a, a, a two-way heat trading concept developed in the Skansi area in Turku and it is well basically it's a like district development project where there is developed a concept for low temperature district heating uh, with, en with enough two-way and open heat energy trading basically this means that um, for example buildings could have um, 
solar collectors or heat pumps there and if the energy or heat energy production is bigger at some times than the demand then they can sell the energy to the district heating grid and the concept includes energy monitoring and control of energy use so these kind of like concepts are worked with and being developed and what is uh, currently in the discussion well firstly about the pricing of energy there are different kinds of pricing models for energy trading and prosumers especially related to the timing of the energy when it's when it's sold and whether real-time energy tariffs should be used and the really interesting is here is also that what is the role of energy trading in the future how it does it change the future business uh, approaches and there is clear, clearly seen uh, new business opportunities both for the building side but also for the energy company side and uh, there are like there could be uh, business for new escos and or it's a, like sort of discussion on and race on going that who will take these new energy services who will start to supply these there are some uh, startups already dealing with this and to conclude uh, so currently the electricity trading concepts or is already a lot easier and it's only about like getting the sort of the technology is there already and it's a lot easier to do while the heat trading concepts are not that mature yet uh, prosumer role is seen to increase in the future and it, it has changes to the energy business and definitely ICT solutions for energy management and controlling are needed to support this and this supports the energy balancing and the increasing of the uh, renewable energy that is often fluctuating but it needs optimization Thank you. Thank you. So energy is important thing in the solution where we have already the energy So it's great to see <coughs> so many of you before break people, also after people. This must be a great seminar because the hall is almost full still. Uh, Matti Nelimarkka, a heater researcher in, in this building, HIIT Helsinki Institute for Information Technology, will talk about well, social media and political power, so meaning this governance open governance, etc. Et Thematics, please. Um, yeah. oh. The mic. Oh. So fancy. Yeah. So this will be streamed to some fancy place. Hello for you in the video. Nice to see you also. So yeah, my name is Matti and I want to speak to you about the social media and political power. And first we need to understand that usually this is the usual political science loop. Ah, no, this was the motivation slide. So. There's a lot of discussion of social media and its role in the political campaigning and its role in the politics. And these are from the last election. So the last elections in Finland were 2015 spring. These are the elections before that. I happen to have some news stories of that. So it's been a topical discussion for some time that social media is used in the political campaigning work and it's actively used there. The candidates use it, the citizens use it. And that creates the question that, okay, how usually technology is considered in political science? And there's usually three stages. 
there's usually the first stage, equalization. When someone says that, okay, we have this new fancy technology, let's call it the web. And the web is going to change how we do politics because every, everyone is now going to be equal. Everyone has the same chances to put their content into the web. And that, that's why we are going to change the power structures. This is usually the first story part of the story. Then after some em empirical research comes the normalization phase. <coughs> and the normalization research phase says that, okay, we studied the equalization hypothesis and it doesn't look like that. It seems that there's still power structures influencing what's happening in the web. And you can change the web into whatever technology you want. And that's the eruption phase. So there's always a new social kind of technology coming up. So from the web, we move to the social media. And again, the political scientists are like, whoa, yeah, we know that this web didn't change how the citizens and politicians interact, but the social media is totally going to do it. That's usually the loop, and then there's going to be some more normalization research. So the constant empirical finding is that normalization takes place. That means that whatever kind of smart city, computer-mediated environment, social media, the web, you name it, it's most likely going to be dominated by those who have power in the real world. That means they have money, they have resources, they have actually people working for them, specialists, stuff like that. And this is the quite common story that never does the technology actually change that much of what we are, what we are seeing. And I'm speaking here because we've been studying what happened in the last election, spring 2015. And our exact research question was, how do the candidates influence traditional media through social media? And traditional media means newspapers, stuff like that. Then we also look a bit about the forms of interaction and forms of camp campaigning that we are seeing. And this is just to give you a, an overview of what we are doing. I'm hoping that I actually have some more smart city related content there. So let's go a few slides really fast. So first, influence on social, uh, candidates influence to traditional media. So there's a huge bunch of candidates who have absolutely no influence to traditional media as we measure it. And then there's few candidates over there who have a lot of influence on what's said in the traditional media. And this is measured by looking what they actually say in social media and then comparing on that what's being said in the traditional media. And we can sort of calculate this kind of idea. And not, not surprising, some indicators like being in the cabinet and being a member of, of the parliament seem to increase your possibilities to be actually heard by traditional media. So this, again, says that we are seeing normalization. And that's already quite a old story, unluckily. Here's something a bit more interesting. So we try to understand the level of interaction. And for these purposes, we split the parties into three groups. So there's large par parties who have over 15% seats in the parliament. That means that they have huge amount of resources. Because in Finland, you get resources based on the number of seats you have in the parliament. And here's how we estimate their interactivity. Then there are some non-parliamentary actors. Uh, they have absolutely no resources. Finnish law don't, doesn't provide them any resources. They might have some resources based on their like, supporters, but mostly you can consider that non-parliamentary parties are non-resourceful parties. And then there are small parties who get some money from the government, some money from the supporter, but they are not as powerful as those in the large parties. And the story here is that we try to say that, okay, it seems that the small parties are more interactive in social media. Uh, we propose that this is due to the fact that th th those guys don't have the resources, so they cannot hire their advertising office to maintain the web presence, the social media presence. They need to be there themselves, and that's why they start to be more interactive, because they actually are there, and it's not by centralized, governed by some specialist in social media. Uh, and this was some interesting thing is that we also see that the candidates interact with each other in social media. And we actually can detect that candidates speak to other candidates from other parties than their own in more negative tone than to candidates of their own parties. And this is what we call Oxenus Infinis. It's a network diagram that absolutely makes no sense at all. 
but this is the new form of campaigning that we observed. Uh, it's from Twitter, it seems that people want to use these kind of hashtags. It's super trendy in Finland now because it was trendy in US like let's say five years ago. So yeah, we're a bit slow. And you can see, for example, Colutus Lupaus. It was one of these campaigns that took place in Twitter and it, they identified around this Colutus Lupaus. There's some other ones also. So of course, each of the parties have their own ones, but then there should be something, but, ah, Suomi Kunto, for example, I, I think it was from the Central Party, uh, no, 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 National Party, uh, Kokomus, in Finnish. But yeah, this all actually tries to say that with data, we can do some sort of fancy da stuff that sort of political science or at least motivated by political science. And now we can move to the smart cities topic. We already heard the buzzword of big data. Uh, I don't actually myself like the term. Everything seems to be big data nowadays. No one actually has properly defined what is big data. There are some rules like there should be volume, velocity, and stuff like that. But big data is buzzword. Let's instead focus on computational data analysis, because that's the difference. We are running some algorithmics to do stuff. And I'm using Facebook as an example. You can put whatever social media service you want there. I'm using Facebook as an example, because in Finland, Facebook is rather popular, especially compared to Twitter. And the second thing is that political science is full of Twitter studies, so we want to actually study something else than Twitter in these slides. And from the Facebook, we can get all sorts of stuff from people. Ordinary people like you and me. Uh, we can try to pull it. If they interact with candidate pages, we definitely get it. If they interact with the candidate's profile, it's a bit more difficult. If they interact on their own pages, it's super difficult, but we are trying to solve that. We want to get a lot of data because we can do smart data analysis or computational data analysis. That means that we can try to create the plots that we created beforehand and try to understand that. And of course, why we want to do is that, that is that we want to gather something societally relevant information, or at least we try to gather something that's hopefully societal, hopefully relevant, and especially hopefully information. This is the usual problem with big data things, is that everyone is like, oh, we got so many status updates. But it doesn't matter if you don't know what you are looking from there. You need to have some background and here we are using the political science as our background to reflect the information, reflect the normalization, for example, or reflect campaigning styles, interactions. Those are quite commonly used topics in political science, and that's why we consider that information, we consider it relevant because hopefully it would help us as researchers, as a society, to reflect what's the role of social media actually. Because there's a lot of me media buzz on that. And for the media bus, we would need some actual research information on that. And of course, the magical box of, of smart data analysis. I haven't spoken anything of that. But the thing is that we should use some of these computational tools like topic models, sentiment analysis, trace and behavioral data analysis. We can use also something more commonly used in political science like qualitative research. The problem with that is that if you have 60,000 Facebook posts, I hope that no, no researcher actually reads them through. I've seen some trying to do that, but they usually say that, okay, after 3,000 I've seen enough and that we are going to do the analysis with the 3,000 messages that I've read because it's just too much. And the whole goal, why I think that I was invited into this speech is that let's forget the elections, let's forget everything. Let's focus on these computational tools and what they can do to smart cities. Because politics shouldn't happen just be during the elections. It should happen also between the elections. I should be able to influence the society, not only every four years when I go to vote, but between those. And these tools, these ideas that we can gather information from social media, and run some sort of analysis to understand what people are actually saying, what they are experiencing, it should be the goal of smart cities. And I actually didn't motivate this in the beginning, but why should it be so? You should, could, could say that, okay, the smart cities are about energy or they could be of something else, but are there cities without the citizens? We need someone actually to be there, otherwise it's 
well, it's almost like this building grew during the summer. There's no one there. There's no city. There's no life. And that moved into that part. And then I'm not the only one thinking about doing this kind of stuff for social media. And the common motivation here is that lots of research, research has shown that people don't believe in politics anymore. And I'm not surprised looking at the current news. It's sort of sad at the moment, I think globally. But people don't feel they don't trust their politicians. They don't be, feel part of the society. And when this happens, the ne next question is that, OK, why should they pay the taxes? Why should they actually try to use any of the smart city services? We need to bring up the trust. We need to be, make the citizens participants, not only service users, but actually engage part of the society. Because that's the only way we actually get them to trust us. That's the only way we get them to provide the data. That's the only way we get the tax money to actually build the infrastructure. And that's also, I think, the only way we should run the society more fundamentally. But yes, some other interesting and quite recent work is that I've been speaking of social media. Uh, Ladante and Assad, Adu, well, the first one focuses on the idea of using crowdsourced data. So what they actually did is that they put, they collect the data from a cyclist. They put some mobile phone application or something like that, and they get actually the roads that the cyclists are using. And based on those roads, they start to discuss that, OK, how should we build the city? How should we plan the roads? That's already taking political decisions. And it's using the data that citizens are producing. This is exactly the idea that I want to go further. Or then there's a nice review paper by John, James, and Aras that speaks about policy crowdsourcing. So instead of having this social media kind of thing, where people say whatever they want, actually administration can go also go out. So in Finland, we have the autoconda.fi. It's an example of place where administration goes out and says that, OK, we are planning this kind of policy. Kindly input your ideas. And these are exactly beyond social media. And these also are nice cases where we can use computational data analysis to run whatever we want. So traditionally, politics is made like this. We have selected few people speaking, making, well, may, making at least a skene, maybe not actually speaking that much relevant information. But the question is that with data generated politics, could we change the dynamics a bit? Could we actually make the citizens be part of the loop? Can the smart cities develop tools where the data would represent the citizens instead of trying to choose candidates who sort of try to represent but not really, could we run with the data? And I think this is, I have a final slide, so questions, comments? Next presentation. All right, thanks for comments or presentations and especially the uh, Center of Excellence is going to be a collaboration uh, between academic and, and, and sort of innovation and, and companies perspective so for this reason we have to a bit shorter than this uh, presentation. The fir first one from, comes from Kone, a company that doesn't need to be any special Perhaps you can present yourself. Yeah, okay. Uh, now, uh, very interesting political science related presentation. So let's go back to, uh, let, let's say, a little, maybe one level down into, into smart buildings. Uh, so my name is Jukka Salmikuukka. I'm a director for New Business Concepts in Kone and uh, going to tell you a little bit about, about our. Uh, approach with APIs and, and, and API economy. And uh, even though I think the main topic here is about smart cities, so, uh, so uh, I see that smart buildings are like, let's say, building blocks for, for smart cities as well. So, so uh, let's, let's get started. 
Okay, uh, probably most of you know, know Kone as, as a company, and uh, I'm not used that much time, time to that, but uh, uh, the reason why we are looking at these APIs is that, of course, API economy is, if, if big data has been the buzzword lately, I think API economy is, is somehow getting there as well, and uh, I think quite interesting uh, uh, detail. I, I just uh, recently heard that, for example, salesforce.com nowadays makes more money through their APIs than, than from the actual usage of their, their CRM by, by their users. So APIs are and can be quite, quite uh, important uh, element for, for business now and, and especially in the future. And uh, maybe before going into the actual APIs, it's, it's uh, good to maybe explain a little bit about background, why and, and how we have been uh, approaching these this, uh, APIs in, in this smart building context. So everything uh, starts from our vision. So we want to deliver the best people flow experience and, and, and uh, it means truly that, that we are looking uh, with, with very close look the end user experience. So better end user experience in the buildings, it usually means that the buildings are more functional and the more functional the buildings are, more value they also generate to the building owners. And uh, traditionally we, we are known from, from these three elements, automatic doors, escalators and elevators. But from, from end user point of view, if you look at the people flow, it's, it's more like this. You have a whole lot more of, of elements there, all the way from uh, arriving outside from the building and, and then all the way to the destination. It can be office, apartment, whatsoever. And of course, this is then linked to the uh, outside the building world where, where we have all the, the let's say smart building, uh, uh, smart city related systems, public transportation, so on and so on. But uh, as a company, we, we focus mainly into this inside the building people flow. And uh, uh, in smart building area, we see that buildings are getting more in integrated, more connected, and there is huge opportunities from, from the interaction between the systems that has been traditionally in their separate silos. And, and we see that also our elevators, escalators and doors, they can't remain as, a, as, a, as a individual islands in the, in the building, but they need to be uh, connected to other systems and, and other functionalities in the building. So what we have been uh, doing is, is looking, looking at the smart buildings and different systems there, and uh, we have defined, let's say, four core areas where, where we have been developing our solutions on this smart building area. We, we call this area like Connect People Flow Intelligence. And, and the elements there are uh, related to access, access control, destination, how to, how to get the people into their final destination, information, being able to provide relevant information to the users while they are moving in the building, and then monitoring how the building manager or owner can monitor that everything is, is uh, uh, working as, 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 the, as it should. But taking this whole people flow journey there, there's huge opportunity, uh, even in, in these areas that we have been defined, but also outside of these areas. And to be honest, even though we have some track record in innovation, it's, it's clear that we can't innovate everything in, in this area ourselves. And even if we could, we don't have the competencies to make this everything happening. And even if we would have competency, we don't have the resources to do it so. So clearly, uh, this is something that we can't do ourselves. We need to have uh, other innovative partners there to work with us to bring this kind of truly 
uh, best people flow experience in the building. Uh, and okay, this is now more looking from individual building or individual end user, but let's, let's take another other view. Uh, we have currently in our customer base something like maybe 300,000 customers. And in our maintenance base, way over a million uh, equipments. And depending how you do the math, each day there, will, there are half a billion to billion end users that interact somehow with, with our solutions. So also in, in a broader concept, I think there is huge opportunities to innovate and bring new solutions for either the, the customers we have, the devices in our installed base, or the end users. And uh, what we have then done in, in, in this area is, is that uh, about a year ago, we, uh, during the Slush event, we announced this Kone API challenge. Basically, we asked the question that, okay, if we open up interfaces to our systems, what kind of applications you, you guys would like to develop? And uh, of course, w one reason why we did that, that was, to, was to get some insight that what kind of APIs we should have in the first place. Secondly, do, can we find interesting comp uh, companies and innovative companies who would be eager to develop stuff together with us? And uh, for both these questions, we, we got quite nice answers to, through this challenge. And, and during this year, we have been uh, uh, developing our uh, approach in this API context uh, further. We have a handful of, of, let's say, pilot partners in this area. Uh, and, and these pilots are developing their solutions together with, with our APIs. And uh, uh, overall, I think everything looks, looks very, very promising at, at this point. And, uh, Next thing is what, what will happen is, is in a few weeks there will be again a slush event and, and we will be there present uh, with, with our own stand. And there we are going to demonstrate with a couple of these, these uh, innovative uh, startup partners some solutions, some, some pilots and some prototypes what we have been doing together during, during this year. So if, if any of you are, are uh, going to be there in the slush, you are more than welcome to visit also our stand to see, see what we have been doing. And, and also during the event, we are going to announce some, some next steps in, in our, our API journey. And as I, as I noticed that uh, in this uh, finest twin smart city uh, program, there is a, a a lot of activity between Helsinki region and, and, and Estonia. It's, it's quite nice that actually one of the, our, our cooperating streams is, is with one, one Estonian startup and, and with one Estonian uh, customer of ours. And, and also that solution will be, will be there piloted and, and shown in, in this last event. So, so like I said, uh, you are welcome to see more there. But, this was very shortly what I had, had in my mind at that point. Any questions? You put something to practice already, or how far are you from implementing something? Well, we have uh, in, in uh, Tallinn, we have uh, first, let's say, uh, uh, real building and, and real customer case installed and, and the, the first application there is, is under development uh, stage at the moment. So that's one very, let's say, concrete, practical uh, thing that we have been doing. And, and also some other, other applications are now on, on, let's say, more kind of lab testing stage. Uh, would you be like to open the APIs in Helsinki for research purposes? For all the uh, 
very good question. Ba basically, we are, we are uh, interested in opening some of the APIs, but, but of course, as, as uh, in our case, all the equipment out there, they are not ours. So, so it's always like a discussion with, with the building owner as well, that if the building owner allows and, and sees, sees the value for, for them to, to have the APIs open and, and some additional services activated on, on top of those APIs, then, then, uh, then that's okay. And, and of course, we are more than interested to discuss what kind of use cases there would be. We are all, uh, currently also developing our APIs further. We have just like first two APIs ready, but, but we see that there will be much more. So, so let's, let's discuss further with uh, how, how to go on with that. But there has been some, some thoughts and thinking already uh, related to this kind of uh, city level activities and how, how our APIs could could play a role in there as well. Oh, what, what kind of arrangements did you do to enable the companies to, to do these pilots? Is it a heavy arrangement from your perspective or is it, is it rather straightforward? Well, heavy and heavy. Of course, there is uh, always the, like the first, first practical installations, they, they are uh, requiring some special arrangements and and like we are very traditional manufacturing company, so, so all this uh, digitalization APIs, it's, uh, it's an exciting learning journey for us. And, and also this API, API area is, is also for us like learning by doing. So quite a lot of things there, there has been, has been uh, required, but, but uh, I think we have, if, if there is, uh, interesting cases for, for demonstrating some or, or piloting some new application which would require the APIs, then, then our R&D is, is prepared to, to support on, on those, those special cases uh, before we can, let's say, productize everything uh, uh, properly. But, but that's, that's definitely what we are eagerly looking, those cases. How do you collect the data of people? Is it monitored? Yeah, well, we do equipment monitoring and, and then, of course, uh, we, we know that, that there is a lot of different ways to count people or, or collect that kind of information. But, but that's, that's something that we are currently also trying to figure out that how we should take that in the next level, paying attention to all the the privacy issues, all, all data ownership issues, and, and things like that. So, so I don't have any, any ready-made answers to you at, at this point. But. Well, that's kind of a good example. Even the stronger actor is somehow, for them, it's somehow easier to, to do the pilots in Estonia, easier than in, in Finland, and the, the center of excellence will probably follow the same, same emphasis. Now, uh, the you. third keynote to show that what we Finns are, are doing, but, but the, the, our Estonian friends were, were watching politely the process, they suggested that perhaps perhaps they should help a bit in, in the program. So <coughs> we invited Reinahas from Harku Yliko here, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting. It's been very interesting to listen to presentations. And my presentation is about uh, one project which is, which is uh, funded by Estonian... Uh, uh, oh, oh. Interesting. Maybe we have to use this PDF. Oh, this is the latest. It's a... Latest time, I think, Yes. <laughs> So we can we can put up this PDF because it's uh, somehow not reading fun. Let's try that. Uh, so the PDF. Yeah, yeah, PDF. Yes. Okay. So. Just mm -hmm. Yeah. Scroll. Okay. 
and it's called Infotechnological Mobility Observatory. Um, Okay, can you help me to make it full screen? If you, if, you, if you do it full screen, I think it's reading pages. Uh, view full screen. I don't know. Oh, I haven't used it. No, okay. It. So just slideshow. Just, oh, yeah. Slideshow. Okay, let's try. Let's try. That. Okay. Okay, good. We can manage with technology in smart city. Um, so the infotechnological mobility, uh huh? No, we can't. <laughs> it's now automatic. Mac is still smarter than. Uh, but the aim of this project is actually to integrate different data sources with uh, mobile and social media based sources and uh, it's cooperation between Tartu University, Tallinn Technical University and Statistics Estonia. And it's founded by Estonian Research Council and it's one of 20 big uh, data infrastructure projects in Estonia. One is also CERN in Switzerland and so on. So we are very lucky to have uh, very good funding actually to integrate data in micro level also connected with social media and with mobile telephone data, with traditional sources like uh, census and state registers, which is uh, very interesting. But uh, in my presentation today, I don't talk uh, so much about this infotechnological mobility observatory, which is generating data infrastructure and developing also legal and privacy related research. But uh, my presentation is a little bit more about uh, smart city related uh, concepts related to use of this data. And several times today it was mentioned that how to use any kind of data and how to define sensor data for smart city. And if we bring an example from uh, Google car or car with no driver, actually. It's possible today to navigate car without any driver. And believe me, computer is doing it better than many of us. And, and it's also not only movement in physical environment, but movement with other cars between, with no drivers. And, and uh, these cars with no drivers are actually using very simple sensor data. It's available and, and it's used in several companies and several cities today. And, and we can ask question that how we can manage cities based on sensor data because a lot of talks about smart city, it is about using sensor data in def different uh, cycles of smart city. And uh, we can say that uh, sensor is some kind of device which is collecting information from environment and uh, providing information from this, analyzing and somehow reacting. It can be CONES uh, lift door or it can be escalator which starts to move, but somehow sensor concept of sensor is very simple and, uh, and uh, we can say that in most of cases, it's much more complicated to collect sensor data from society or human behavior and from uh, social processes. And this is always very big question how to collect individual microdata or crowdsourced data from society, how to turn it to useful information and how to use it as knowledge to improve performance of city or, or, or any other unit. Uh, from our research lab, which is mobility lab in University of Tartu, we work a lot with mobile telephones. Using telephones as sensors, very simple sensors to collect information about location. It's the easiest thing is location but mobile telephones have many other sensors. And this is one example of 
smartphone-based mobile tracking. It's my footprint last summer in near my Kesamökki in South Estonia. And, and uh, we can get very good signal of GPS from smartphone, very detailed, very good for transportation modeling and all kind of behavioral studies. And if we link it with uh, uh, sensors from Android phone, we can get much more interesting data. We can get information about my movements inside of home and my, my motority and motility and things like this. And this information is very often used in, in many cases, but I just bring you one example from our study, what we did for Eurostat, because Eurostat is very much thinking about starting to use mobile telephone-based statistics, because there is lack of cross-border statistics, there is problem with tourist statistics, there is problem with household statistics, and mobile phones are one important source for uh, collecting this. And you can see this uh, visibility study from our website or from, uh, from uh, Eurostat website. And this first example, what we did is, is using this very simple digital track from, uh, from smartphone. And the and, uh, question was how to define domestic tourism. Domestic tourism, by definition of United Nations and uh, Eurostat, is movements and uh, consum consumerism which is happening outside of usual environment. And using such kind of uh, digital movement track and behavioral data, we defined several individual thresholds, how we can measure usual environment and how we can, we can define domestic tourists for, for single persons. And, uh, and uh, as a result, we can say that, that actually this very simple digital program or app actually developed very interesting result for, for uh, Eurostat and also for statistical offices because it's always been a big issue of of measuring to domestic tourism, uh, measuring monetary value or money generated by domestic tourism. With this uh, very small innovation actually of making easy app and measuring, we can, we can see how big value actually is generated in cross domestic product by domestic tourism and for example, Estonian National Bank is already using our mobile database statistics and it's, it's very easy innovation but actually has great value for the field of statistics and industry. Second type of data that we use from mobile phones is more, even more scary. It's using memory files of mobile network operators which is called also called digital records. And we have long history. We started collection of called digital records in Estonia uh, 2004. So we have full economic cycle of, of uh, location of all mobile telephones in Estonia. And second example with this data, what I bring is that uh, we did one paper about uh, measuring uh, social segregation indexes in space and time with this data. Which is, you know, smart city concept is very much about social equality and, and uh, inclusiveness of cities. And uh, using such uh, mobile operators, memory files, it's very easy to measure actually different dimensions. And it's not only that this data is easier to collect than traditional census data. You can measure it for every minute and every location, which is very different from traditional census data. So basically, the result of this use of mobile data was that we can measure that during business hours on business days. Actually, ethnic segregation in Tallinn is much lower than measured by census because city has mixed workplaces, transportation roads, shopping centers, everybody is mixed. And we cannot see big segregation like in United States, for example, where you live your life 
in, in one neighborhood and you don't go out. Only after midnight uh, we can see that sleeping populations have much more segregated than uh, uh, in census data. So basically using mobile data, individual sensor data for telephones helps to, to develop new kind of indications to go much more precise in time and space. And of course it's also possible to, to do uh, different applications with this big mobile data. For example here is something what we developed for rescue board of Estonia, uh, we can measure de facto or population, which is people present in North Tallinn during daytime and nighttime. If something happens or even emergency planning is, is in process, it's very valuable information what kind of population segments and how many people actually we can find in these neighborhoods. Because uh, in, in Estonia, especially in many uh, fast-changing countries, registers and, and address databases are not so good. So basically, we can, we can say that big mobile data is very interesting and we can use it for different purposes. And, uh, and we can conclude uh, that actually mobile data normally covers full population, which is very good. There is in Estonia, I think, phone penetration is 96% today, and in most of countries it goes. A second point, which is very important for this kind of data or sensor data, is timeliness. You can, normal census cycle in most of countries takes at minimum two years. With uh, cellular census or mobile census, you can, you can get the results same day, basically, if you have pre-developed algorithms. Uh, it's possible to compare different countries, Africa and Estonia, Finland and Estonia, because basic concept and standard of GSM network or 3G and 4G network is similar. And of course, last point is very important that uh, mobile data is longitudinal. If census or questionnaire survey is about five minutes or last week, mobile data, if collection started by somebody, it's normally years. And you can see variability and different situations, what's happening when it's very hot in July and, and so on. So basically, mobile phone data as sensor data about population has many good sides. Uh, of course, mobile data is not uh, uh, it has many problems. Access to data is not easy. You know it from Finland and we know it from several countries. Privacy is a big issue and related to many points. Uh, still a lot of work with validation of uh, call data, record data and even smartphone data because we have re to study carefully is this situation we can see in Sierra Leone or, or any other country from mobile data uh, according to reality and of course uh, it's secondary data we don't have much about motivation behind trips for example which is very important for transportation management or we don't know actually social status of phone owners and so on so on so there are different aspects we have to remember when we use mobile telephone data as sensors data but, uh, but basically, if we start conceptualizing for smart city, what kind of case studies and what kind of data cases are good for, uh, for uh, using it uh, as uh, sensor data for smart cities, I think it's very important to say that, that actually one level of, of Sensor data is very easy. It's from machine to machine. Opening gates, opening whatever, moving uh, trains and automatic uh, uh, systems for traffic safety, intelligent traffic systems, they are working well because we have two side by machines and machines can talk easily to each other. So it's the it's easiest level of sensor data and we can see it everywhere uh, 
around. Second type of, uh, of uh, level is person to machine. Actually, there is also quite good, uh, quite good uh, applicability and use, for example, navigation with, with uh, telephones, using information services, uh, getting uh, machine reading or, or any other data uh, for personal devices. And I think it's very, very good business case with this uh, individual level lease from Uber, uh, which is, uh, I think, active in Finland too, but, but I know that you had also, like everywhere, discussions, which maybe is part of this business plan, but, but uh, Uber is coming and doing very simple innovation, actually, with this machine to person, which and we can digitalize link between demand and supply. Connect it, and we don't need taxi stands, we don't need taxi operators, it's all going. And, and uh, I think this innovation related in travel behavior and transportation related to Uber is coming uh, visible actually in maybe three or five years, when actually cars with no drivers are out here in Helsinki and everywhere, and cars with no owners are out. So actually this business model is very much, this is only begun, beginning of, of working in. When we have ready cars with no drivers in cities, actually we can see that uh, it's easy to manage this fleet, and next step is actually change in, in ownership and, and uh, monetizing uh, model is car with no owner. So it's like bicycle rental, but bicycle is running to you from closest point you select. And this is actually, I think in five years, we can see in, at least in big cities uh, in, in some countries what's happening. So, so this level of, of personal device, your location as sensor data and car location and building digital link between is, is one way of looking this as how smart city solutions can use it. So much more complicated is using big data or mobile data or any kind of data is there is more than one person in charge. Uh, like Chinese Communist Party, which has very complicated way of making decisions or, or any democratic uh, council in, in Western country. It's not so easy. And, and actually, actually, society machine, but it's not easy. And this is actually the reason why smart city is not using much sensor data or it's using only in level of knowledge that, okay, we can do better policy recommendations and we can improve our policy process, but it's not so easy to develop direct links because city is very complicated with many layers, with many people uh, and the season process. Still, we can see that there are many and many probably when you travel or you look CNN or BBC or you, you look Facebook, there's always hundreds of pictures about moving telephones, moving uh, ships and goods and everything. And there is quite of, quite of a very popular way of, of trying to analyze movement of all kinds of things and to develop visual analytics based on this. And some people think that actually this visual analytics is very much helping as a creating some knowledge base, for example, to making political decisions. One, one interesting development is this uh, global database for events, language and tone, which is, which is actually uh, trying to predict also political crises in the world using different social media data. And, and there is also many skeptical people which telling that actually big data is just just way that society and world is changing so fast that mankind is trying to understand what's happening. 
And this is the reason why we all like to look from BBC Digital uh, our all kinds of uh, nice maps and pictures and floating uh, goods and whatever. But actually this information is never used for reasonable policy process or making good decisions. So it's like this mink is looking from water and, and looking that we don't know his understanding this mirror or not, but that it's interesting to have overview what's what's happening and moving. And uh, and uh, from this point, actually, I think we can. I want to conclude my presentation with with uh, some task for uh, this project or this center of excellence. That that actually it's a, it's a very good potential. Uh, to start developing uh, new generation of business models, how to use social sensor data in smart cities. Because it's not easy, as you see from individual level, this case of Uber digitalizing some connections is very easy. When we go more complicated systems and uh, crowdsourcing uh, data, it's not so easy. And I think one of the next innovations in, in this field in, in uh, smart city and related businesses is, is actually to develop business model which is, which is making use of this data. As, as you, can, you can see, for example, some car applications can, can already make data with this digital location of cars. It means that there's probably need for innovations, change, probably we need not Kone only in lifts, but probably full house <coughs> is changing whatever, everything, if people is demanding it or <coughs> and many more. So this business model never can happen alone. There's need to have technological say, change same time. And technological change is not that we can see from Twitter data that there are so many young people in, in Kadayanokka. But, but uh, this, we still miss this link with this technological change. So it's very interesting position. I think it's very good position for, for excellent, <coughs> sorry, center to do it. Thank you very much. <coughs> oh, um, seems to be so that, that <coughs> comments are, are more, more easier to make immediately after, after hearing <coughs> seminar is a flexible process as you can see. So if you have any, any rapid immediate <coughs> comments, please. Thank you for a very inspiring presentation. Uh, as usual, you, the things you show from Estonia are, are really, really nice what you have been doing with mobile phone data. Uh, how do you see, so this, there are two questions I suppose. So how do you see the situation at the moment in Finland in the sense that how could we reach the same kind of situation of the availability of mobile phone data so that we could be doing more sort of individual based analysis as, as you are able to do in Estonia. Uh, and maybe another question is that, that as you then continued in your presentation to the uh, services like Uber and others, so would my data approach, so the fact that persons could themselves be the, sort of donating data for service providers, so that they would be a data donation models, or could that be helping in, in the availability of, of data? So first the mobile phone data mm -hmm. question, what should we do in Finland? And then the other question is, that is my data approach something that could be Yes, thank you. I think uh, mobile phone data, it's, it's uh, not an easy task in Finland because you have very different regulation from many European countries. And now we know, know that from last year there is change also in European regulation. And actually many member states, including Estonia, is starting to overlook uh, this uh, 
permits and, and uh, ceiling levels for data use. So actually, we are even in opposite process in, in EU that, that uh, it can be much more strict uh, in Finland and Estonia and many countries. But basically, I think that, uh, that uh, actually this problem of having this data is, is, uh, will, will be solved. Actually, I think that private uh, data corporations will start. And actually, actually we, can, we, we know that there are private data co corporations already, for example, if you are using Facebook, actually, or Google. You give rights to use this data to Google and Facebook. Same with Microsoft, actually. So basically what I can see that, that probably it is problem to get mobile telephone data from mobile phone companies. But uh, nobody or not many people complaining, maybe some Germans, about Facebook or Google. And, and actually, I can see that, that uh, actually uh, and Google and uh, Facebook and others, they make a lot of money with analyzing data, but analyzing it only inside of Facebook. Facebook is not giving data away. This is reason why, why nobody can see Facebook-based analysis, for example. Google is not giving data away. Twitter is different use case, but but, and basically, I think in five years, most of us have telephones, Google telephones, Microsoft telephones, or, or Facebook telephones, basically. And we are not complaining because service is so nice. And the uh, amount of data, and there is Google car, Google telephone, and everything is Google which is another question of ethical and, and uh, business and markets. But, but basically, we can see that actually this data is moving and there are organizations making money from it, but it's inside of big corporations and they have their own scientists and own cities. Yes? Of course, and I know that there is one big project in EU. Actually, it's about medical. Uh, it's about uh, what is uh, personal medicine data, digital medicine data. And actually, everybody can give uh, own. It's like data cooperative. If you, if, if you, you like to be help society, you can give your data to this cooperative, and cooperative is regulating. But it's not very successful because big uh, pharmaceutical companies and, and things. So there are initiatives to develop such kind of things. But these big companies have a lot of money and power. And it's not so easy to, to start telling that. And there is privacy. That if I give my medical data to so everybody starts to think. And it's not so easy. But there are processes. Okay, thank you. Then, still mobile mobility. Brothers and sisters, I should say, terviseks mieltiv tutvutap. But I, I still think that everybody's interest is that I continue in English. So I was asked to uh, present one, one particular research uh, uh, project called Traffic Sense, Energy Efficient Traffic with Crowd Sensing. And, and uh, so it's kind of like a combination of some motivational things plus then, then uh, kind of like actually quite concrete research results. And uh, and uh, I will uh, not make so, so much of this like energy efficiency. We'll, we still have to acknowledge that this is funded by the Aalto Energy Efficiency Program. But, but uh, okay, due to personal interests and, and uh, because I think that's probably more interesting to this audience, I will concentrate on the crowd sensing uh, part. And similarly uh, to the previous talk, so we consider crowd sensing to be kind of like sensing the environment with, with uh, mobile phones. So this is the crowd of people that, that is involved uh, in the project uh, currently. 
So this is actually how we started two years ago in 2014. So we thought of uh, kind of like we had a concrete idea of developing a mobile phone app that would actually do some sort of like a data logging and, and we figured out that okay once we have the data then we can actually use, use it for, for uh, kind of like sensible stuff. Maybe we could learn the regular routes of people or, or maybe we could predict the, the routes and, and knowing that then we could actually build stuff on, on top. And uh, so, so here are, here are kind, of, kind of like our initial idea of, of uh, w when we uh, started the, the project. Okay, so then, then my only, only reference to kind of like the energy saving potential, so there's some, some data about how, how much energy is used on traffic, so, so around roughly uh, one third is, uh, of all energy is spent on traffic, so we immediately see that, that of course there's uh, like lots of potential to save kind of like the total consumption of energy by, by concentrating on traffic. And uh, maybe it's a little bit more difficult to like quantify the energy use of, of kind of like a whole metropolitan area, but kind of I, I think also of interest for, for this, this research project is to make this kind of like a differential energy use uh, comparison through individual choices. Of course when I come to work, so, so I, I can Come, uh, come by car, or I may choose to take the bus, or maybe maybe uh, take a bike ride. And this type of energy uh, use is quantifiable in within like our uh, our research project. Okay, these are these are some of the people or some of the research groups that are involved in the in the consortium. So it's actually kind of like a mix of rather different uh, uh, capabilities. So so. I'm, I'm leading the parsimonious modeling uh, research group, so my personal interest is in, in uh, computation and data analysis, machine learning and data mining and stuff like that. So we do, do learning and prediction analysis, but then there are also other, other uh, people, software engineering, then actually service development and, and uh, all, all kinds of stuff. So, so this is kind of like a very versatile combination of, of different uh, abilities. So this is rather technical, technical description. I will not, not go into the details, but uh, let me just summarize, summarize it quickly. So, so in the above of this schematic, we have, of course, we work with a, some sort of a map abstraction. We have actually uh, uh, imported a whole open street map database of Finland into our system. Then we have to agree on the representation of, of roads and crossings so, so that we can actually describe routes, routes uh, as they are happening. And then the second box is, is about um, use of uh, mobile phones and being able to actually sense uh, like mobility patterns. And, uh, and then uh, as we will see later on, then we will be able to predict things. And then actually on top of those predictions, we can ac then actually um, make something useful. For instance, suggestions or, or or, or notifying of some, some uh, exceptions and so on. But uh, actually my, my personal like a technical goal is to be able to predict well, and this is what I will report. And it's actually, we have worked so that we have actually introduced kind of a separation of concerns. So we, we just aim to predict things and, and then, then of course it, um, there are all, all kinds of fancy, fancy things that can be built on top of those predictions. And so, so that, that we can actually say that what we are building uh, in, the, in the research project is kind of a research platform. So it, it does not solve any individual problem, but it's kind of like a platform that enables to build, uh, for instance, a, a ride-sharing system, if you like. So we can use the data collection uh, uh, and, and uh, analysis capabilities in order to solve this particular problem, if that happens to be our interest. So this is actually a look on, on the, our Android application. So this is not an, an end, use, end user application. So this is actually just a software used by, by the research uh, project members. And we have logged quite, quite a lot of data, data with it. And and, and some, some of it actually we have shared. So the problem with sharing is that, of course, the whole database is, is in the matters of uh, 
tens of gigabytes, but I have shared, I think it was something like a 300 megabytes, which is more or less still manageable by, by, uh, by downloading. All right, and once, once this, this application is in use, then, then uh, uh, we can actually like log traces, like, like maybe some user actually came to autonomy area, and there's a kind of like a, a trace, uh, basically a data path, path uh, to this place, and this is basically the raw materials that we are using in, in our uh, uh, predictive uh, analytics work and analysis work in general. Then a zoom down uh, map of, of our map representation. So as, as I said that we have actually in, uh, imported the OpenStreetMap database to our system. And, and if, if, you, if I would oversimplify, so basically these roads, there are road segments and crossings. And road segments are, are joined together by a set of crossings. But then, then, due to the like real life complications, there there's a, like quite a bit of detailed technical work that you have to actually do, do, and this you have to somehow automate because it's 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 going to be too much work to do do by hand. Okay, so then then this is actually where where we are currently. So so um, in the beginning we we just had the the. Uh, mobile client in order to log in, but now, now we have reached a, kind of like a, um, a nice, nice uh, state where this research platform has, has both the mobile client and all, all, all the kind of like the needed server infrastructure in place. And I should all, uh, also uh, repeat once more that this is not built for one particular purpose. This is a research platform and if you wish to, to um, develop some sort of a, a mobility app for tourism, then it's possible to build on top of this. Or if you want to build a ride-sharing system, it's, it's uh, like one of, one of the goals that can actually, uh, one of the things that can be uh, implemented on top of that. So I will not, not uh, bother you about the technical details, but it's probably noteworthy that it's, it is quite a complicated system. And I have actually personally I've been amazed by the kind of like the complexity of the software and, and how we actually build it. So there's, if you happen to know, know there's a, a kind of scalable and automated deployment tool called Chef. And we have actually from the beginning, we have actually like coded the rules of building the system in a sense that that, or in a way that it's almost like begging for a second and a third and a fourth kind of like installation. So we have actually been playing with the idea without actually knowing, knowing about this context that, okay, we, now we are working with Finland. What, what, how would we do things if we actually install this, this system uh, in Estonia? And this is kind of like possible in, in the sense that we have actually uh, built it all. Then, then on the... Um, Right top top corner, there are also some references to the prediction prediction models. Those are already uh, kind of implemented in the system. Then I took a few slides from uh, from a slide set of of Jesse Reed that actually works with the predictive analytics part. So so this is the main idea is to to use all of the the log data and then build some kind of like a, a, a model of traveler movements and and uh, uh, that, that's what we, I will uh, demonstrate in the few slides. But there are kind of like one chicken and egg problem, which is not, not really a major problem, but, but it, it is still there. So we need travel data in order to do predictions and in order to do meaningful things. But of course the user wants the meaningful things already before we have a kind of like a, 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 a sizable uh, data set. So, so, uh, I see some, some kind of like, or there are plenty of issues in, in kind of like bootstrapping the system as, as, as such. Okay, so then big data was mentioned a few times uh, in the presentations and, and we have decided to take quite a, like a complementary approach. And so, so we, we kind of like call uh, this approach the small data approach 
because it's, it scales nicely to the solution. So, for instance, if, if uh, the system would be uh, tuned to help, for instance, Kalle in his, his mobility needs, then, then I think it's a relatively straightforward uh, idea that, okay, we should use Kalle's data and, and tune the prediction model to, to his needs. And this is what, what we are, we are uh, promoting. Also, there are like, uh, uh, like limited privacy concerns because we don't mix the data of all users and possibly even we could uh, implement the prediction models in, in Carlos' phone without uh, needing uh, to transfer a whole lot of data uh, here and there. So here are actually some, some uh, examples of the log data. So, so, um, so far, so this is not, not uh, used by a vast population of users, but we are using, using that in, uh, within our research group, so maybe, maybe some 15, 20 installations. But this is kind of like a period of, let's say, two weeks from one user. And what I will, what I will present is, is it, what kind of simple things you can, you can uh, uh, do with the data. So this is, let's say, Let's assume this is a, a, the study period is two weeks. The black dots are basically the places where the user has been during this period. So then we take another view. So we look, look at the individual places on the map and say that, okay, we count the total number of records for each point. And in the very middle and the lower left corner, there are like large circles. So, so from without any any uh, more complicated analysis, it's safe to say that these are actually probably home and work, and we actually know this from, from, from the particular user. So, so uh, kind of hotspots, like uh, important locations like that can be easily identified. Then, then uh, <clears throat> during this period, so uh, we can also visualize the number of days each point is visited. So there seems to be kind of like a, a sequence of large circles. So this is actually the daily commuting route. And this is, uh, maybe, maybe it's even Kalle, Kalle that goes from home, home to work on this. So then our prediction is basically tuned for this, this, this type of data. We don't need to optimize this model for the whole metropolitan area, but we use, use it, use it for, for providing personal uh, kind of benefit. Then yet another view is, is that you can actually measure the average time spent consecutively at each point. So, so it, it actually you go to some place, stay there for a while, and then go away. So, so then, then you can actually, for instance, identify visits, for instance, maybe a weekly hobby, hobby place for sports or, or something, something uh, like that. So then, then a little bit of uh, technical stuff still about uh, prediction, so um, then, then we use, um, let's say, many types of predictive models. Uh, if you happen to know like a technical term like hidden Markov model, these type of models and, and, and their extensions are, are heavily used, or then, then multi-label classification techniques that Jesse and I have uh, developed. But basically, it's, the prediction problem is such that once you know the, the history, then you want to actually uh, predict the future. So, for instance, uh, for me, this would mean that, that given that I have come here, so what will be my mobility pattern from, from here on? So maybe at, at five o'clock or six o'clock, the model predicts that I actually will go home because this is uh, often present in, in the data. And I should mention that this, this uh, prediction uh, kind of like uh, uh, technologies, they are, they are uh, generic in the sense that, that, that we can basically try to predict anything if we have uh, uh, just recorded data, data about it. So the obvious choices would be then, for instance, the future tra trajectory. Will I go home using this route or will I go home using that other route? Or then, then uh, predicting the destinations. So will I go shopping or will I go home? or will I go and do, do sports at, a, at some place, maybe predicting points of interest, or, or then uh, travel time, for instance. 
and we can actually combine these in, in single models so that there's not not uh, uh, we can we can do kind of like a let's say uh, plenty of predictions uh, at once. Here are a couple of uh, examples still about the prediction. So in the lower left corner there's a the red circle, this is the person's home, and the predictive model in this particular case has actually predicted the route correctly, so there's alignment of the true route and the predicted route, and this was actually done, the prediction was done actually before the person even begins the, the travel. And this is basically because it was in the, in the uh, recorded data, this, this uh, prediction was made at 8.30, so maybe based on experience, this would be like a typical, typical thing to happen. Then in the evening at 7.30, then the person returns home and, and there's a nice alignment of the true route and the, and the predicted route, as in this figure. All right, so this is a kind of like a concrete, concrete um, status of our, our research project, Traffic Sense, and, and uh, I hope you, you heard like a little bit of motivation, but also like a relatively concrete technical results what we have achieved. And, and then of course, we are always, uh, we always welcome uh, people to discuss about possible collaborations or, or maybe providing an installation for some, some purpose yet to be discovered. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you again, Kalle, for inviting us. And uh, I'm coming from, my name is Mikko Patroka. I'm the business development responsible for our company, Ixonos. And uh, we are a mid sized company based, ICT company based in Helsinki, in Hertoniemi. And uh, what we do this is that we do digital projects for our customers. Customers like, uh, like Jukka, Jukka was, have, was here, Kone, which means Finnish industry, and uh, but also other segments like media and and retail. R retail and, and today, very interesting topic is, is our project with Viking Line and, and how to develop a digital cruise experience for, for passengers. And, um, and uh, wh why is this relevant now, now for this, this seminar? We are not uh, university research people, we, we are more, more kind of business people. And, and, um, and, but, but when we talk about these twin cities and digital projects, I mean, we see many interesting things is that both in Tallinn and Helsinki, there's a lot, big population of advanced mobile users. And uh, secondly, we have a very, very high traffic between these two cities. I mean, we have multiple ferry companies operating there. We have leisure passengers, but we have also professional traffic traffic over here. And uh, thirdly, I mean, what we are looking for is we are looking for industries which are a little bit kind of not in the forefront of implementing digital technologies and services. And, and marine industry has been like that for, for some time. So, so for many, cent I mean, not centuries, but uh, tens of years, like the cruising experience has been really the, really the same, same as, as it used to be. So that, that's why we think this is very, very interesting. Change this. So a little bit first about our, our company as, as such. So we have about 300 people and uh, not only in Finland, uh, we have offices in in US and in uh, in UK and also in Singapore, which is not, not mentioned here. It's, it's not enough to be the, if you want to be the leader in the global perspective, to be leader in Finland, that's, that's not enough. I mean, we have tackling very small market here. And uh, secondly, our approach is that we, are, we employ a lot of design people. So I mean, like when we discuss about mobile services, I mean, everybody has your mobile phone and, and you, maybe you have 100 applications here. But what really matters is that, that you, there's an application that is valuable for the user. 
is easy to use. And uh, last week I also heard from one customer that he added that that uh, it needs to be funny. He he added that was a third third aspect. And uh, and uh, I think with this project we also reached that a little bit, little bit. I I hope you can see it later on. But we have about 300 people here in all together. So what what is uh, Ixnos approach to to technology? I mean we have a lot of uh, and digitality, digitalization. So we have a lot of interesting technologies available, and a lot of industry projects are concentrating on that. And in the marine side, there's a lot of challenges what we need to solve. There's a kind of connect, connectivity out in the sea. There's even 2,000, 3,000 passengers over there, how to provide them, them some bandwidth. Then there's, you know, vessels as steel structures, so how can you really provide them a mobile signal and so on. But, but still, we kind of claim that, that uh, only combining these three angles can really make a successful mobile, mobile service and an application. So secondly, it's about business. Business as such, and uh, we cannot also do this without our, our customers' money. And they are looking for, for revenue from their customers. So we really need to be also business-oriented in the sense, and I'm also referring to Jukka Salmikuka when he was talking about this people flow. So the bigger business case we take, the more money there, there is to solve. And many industries are doing the, so that they are monitoring, maybe their machines, monitoring cars or so, but they are taking only very small narrow angle on that. So addressing the whole business case is, is vital. And thirdly, about the design. So so that uh, also Jukka was mentioning that we are all individuals and, uh, and uh, we all are users of the service. So, so design is, is also a very vital part of the, of the of the of successful service. So in in all in all, I mean in a successful service, all these these are combined. Well, this is not a short short sprint what we have done with Viking Line. So Viking Line came to us already two years ago and. Uh, and we have been now working two years, and now we launched the service last month. Month and uh, and uh, maybe our, our designers felt a little bit seasick because they had to be there for I think they made 11 or 12 trips on the ferries, and Viking Line wanted to always meet on the ferry. F ferry, ferry. So so this is what what really happened in practice, and uh, this is just a normal, very normal digital process what we did, did, and and uh, which means several phases of concepting and interviewing customer and, and doing a little bit consumer research, then prototyping, and then finally the coding work. What was also surprised to me is that how many different kind of professionals you need to produce this service. I mean, you need coders, and then you need designers, and, and people who create visuals, and, uh, and then user research people, and so on. So everybody has their own role where they in the play in the, in the process. So this is what what Viking Line came to us, and 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 this is about the business angle. So what they wanted to wanted to develop, and and uh, and very natural things. So so I mean, getting when when people are in the cab, oh, first of all, minimize cabin time. So get people to move around on the vessel and and spend spend uh, their money to earn earn more revenue. Secondly, uh, if people are staying in the cabins, then also I mean, offer them chances to 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 use the ship services, since, uh, even though you are you are not in the in the place or in the tax free shop or so on. Then third is very important. I mean, we are talking about here. Our, my Estonian colleague was there mentioning that connecting machines to people is is kind of working. But that, but we also came to the same conclusions with Viking Line that that not only connecting tax free to persons is nice, but connecting people. It's, it's really the essential key, and, and we also claim this that that, uh, that what is important for a cruise passenger is to connect to a fellow passengers. Whatever I mean, somebody likes running, somebody likes to go to a disco or whatever. But but people interaction is really the key, key not only the machine human interaction. Then about tax free, of course, and then people flow. How the people really behave also before the cruise because. Some of the money can be already spent before the cruise, like for, for tax-free shopping, for instance. You can order in advance and, 
and a little bit, bit of the prepare for the experience. And, and uh, six, we have a lot of practical problems to solve. So the, the Wi-Fi networks need to be rebuilt for the whole whole ships, and and some uh, some other stuff as well. How the people will get the application and so on. So this is what we came came all about, and and uh, this is now li live on live and kicking and and uh, and uh, we were very pleased with this because uh, last month uh, this was the, the top one passenger application in in Finland and and also in the top five of the all loaded applications in 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 the Apple and Play Store in in Finland and uh, and uh, and re really sorry about this I mean if you want to, want to go to the practicals can, you can go to the Apple Store and download it under Viking Line, and you see how the services now it's loading. But now we start start going there. So you go to the iOS Store or Play Store and down, download your own own application. So we have now created a platform for for Viking Line. But what makes this interesting for research communities is that 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 now we really have a, a platform that we can really try out new services based on this. I mean, all the technical problems have been solved now. And we really welcome research people and then also small companies, even bigger companies, to develop the services with us and, uh, and, and Viking Line. And, and we have implemented some of the basic stuff is there, but a lot of, lot of things are, are yet to be discovered. And, and the good news is that, that really the Caribbean operators are also interested in this. There's a global market. We heard from Turku Sipja that the cruising industry is, is growing about four to five percent per year. The rest of the marine is now a little bit having a silent times, but cruising industry is, is is booming, and especially in Asia, there seems to be growth for the next five to ten years, even, even more beyond that. So, so there's really good possibilities to to and, and please please come and talk to talk to us about about this. So. If you want to take a look or download the application, at the end I wanted to show you a small video that, that uh, how does it really work to be in a, uh, in, a, in ownership in in Viking Line. Let's see that if I get it working. To we get some sound. Oops. In the meantime, this is an EU project, after all, so please fill the blankets, uh, if you haven't already. I mean, the white, what's the name of it? The registration. Registration that you have been here. So we can show that the seminar was all successful. Okay. Now oh, we have something. Hopefully we have sound. No. Welcome aboard. Each line is proud to present a new kind of experience for your cruise. 
Just download the app from your phone's app store and you're good to go. With the built-in sensory shopping catalog, burn surprise from the comfort of your cabin and add it to your virtual shopping list. Once you're in the sensory store, find the products you've already added and drop them in your basket. Kuikkaniemi, I come from Helsinki Institute for Information Technology, so my office is just upstairs. And, uh, and for some reason there is uh, <laughs> automation in these slides. I don't know how that happened, but, <laughs> but it's, uh, I used to do a presentation in Google Docs and now this is PDF exported from there. So for some reason there is an auto loop in the slides. So. Okay, but anyway, so uh, I'm talking about my data. It's a project that we have had now for uh, two, three years in HIT. Uh, one of the core uh, milestones in the project that we have had is, uh, is this uh, report that we uh, have been publishing, two reports that we have been publishing uh, together with Ministry of uh, Transport and Communications on uh, describing this model and what does it mean actually. And the whole idea Okay, sorry about the Finnish language there, but the whole idea about my data is that it is a human-centric approach to personal data management and identity management. Uh, so basically, uh, we all know that personal data is everywhere. Uh, we have heard already about the presentations regarding the mobility, uh, but we have to uh, acknowledge that personal data uh, perhaps the biggest domain and the, for personal data at the moment is web services. Uh, we know Facebook, we know Google, GAFA as German uh, French people talk, call them like really like this big walled garden uh, environments for, which are fundamentally based on utilizing personal data and building services as a trade-off uh, for privacy. But uh, digitalization is basically changing uh, industry everywhere. There are no single sector probably that will won't be eventually influenced by digitalization. And one of the key drivers in digitalization is data. And, uh, and when we talk about services for P2C, we are talking about personal data. So uh, that's the core. And, uh, and when we uh, look into different kind of reports, like in the big picture, there is, for example, Boston Consulting Group uh, uh, has published uh, a book called the value of digital, our digital identity and there they estimate that in four or five years the value of personal data or digital identities is up to one trillion euro in, in EU only. And this is uh, 
uh, decrease much more than uh, the value of uh, Facebook and Google and so forth. So, so the value of actually personal data and, and assets related to that is, is surpassing of what, what is currently the uh, digital services market. And this is mainly to digitalization that, uh, that this is driving force for digitalization. Uh, uh, elsewhere, uh, World Economic Forum has also coined uh, that uh, personal data is becoming new economic asset class. So it's, uh, it's not only just uh, uh, enabler for new, new uh, kind of tools and new kind of services, but it's actually component that uh, should be regarded as an economic resource. Um, there are some examples, like we heard that, uh, for example, this co-ops that uh, that uh, allow people to donate their data or exchange their data in, in plain money. That's not really a market yet, but there's uh, many indications that this kind of data banking scenarios uh, may happen in future. And there is not only one, but actually several startups are, and, and even middle-sized companies that are looking for this data banking as a business model. Well, uh, then on the downside, or on, on the other hand, looking on this, even in the BCG report, they say that if there is no trusted flow of data or if the structures or the infrastructure for managing personal data is not realized, then two thirds of this value uh, might disappear that is now blooming or sort of potentially emerging to this market. And uh, elsewhere also consumers state that 78% have, 78% of individuals have challenges in trusting companies how they are dealing with their personal data. And that, that's not a surprise. I think that uh, when you look at those I agree agreements, like uh, end users license agreements, uh, it's a joke. Like you are not really trusting, on, because you cannot comprehend. Like it was just an uh, update in Apple, uh, Apple uh, iOS uh, end user agreement, and it was 56 pages. Like can you imagine reading those 56 pages? Nobody can imagine. So the whole privacy has becoming an uh, Privacy management has becoming a sort of uh, lost battle in some people's eyes that the, the current mechanisms on managing that situation is not really uh, feasible. And as we heard already earlier now, the EU legislation is going to change. We heard already what happened with the, uh, with the safe harbor and there's the EU GPDR, there's EU uh, PSD2 directives coming and, and this can change the landscape even uh, quite dramatically. But overall, it's not only about legislation or policies. Building trust is uh, that uh, happens between individuals and people and between systems. And it, it is a complex issue that requires both education, education, new, new kind of infrastructure, and, uh, and uh, the whole new approach on customer relationship management. And the my data principles can be divided because of that in three different uh, levels. So first of all comes the right to the data. So uh, human-centric right to data. We have right to our data that it's describing somehow related to us. And in some sense, this is trivial because we have that right already, but it's not really practical. And that's the second point that uh, uh, our right to uh, uh, as for uh, the data received on all user registries is, is not really convenient. We are often not able to do it in practical sense, and if we get that data, it, we cannot really do anything with it. That so, so the practical way of uh, getting access to data would be to have some kind of API, which is uh, computer-based, uh, based on uh, uh, practical machine-readable uh, formats, open formats, and standards, so forth. And this is very much analogous on what is the uh, formulation of package around open data. But then it comes the third aspect, so open business environment. How can we uh, realize interoperability between different actors? Because it's not really about just having access to data, but have been able to manage how the data is flowing and how services can be built on top of that. Uh, so in that sense, uh, my data is not, uh, many people, uh, confuse my data often uh, with personal data. Like the, in some organization, for example, there is a little bit hype around my data, but they often talk it like it would be analogous to personal data, but that it's not. Uh, my data is a subset of personal data. It's a subset uh, of personal data that individual can manage by themselves and is accessible in machine-readable form. 
Uh, another way of describing what my data model is about is to compare it to uh, existing ways of organizing data. Uh, on one hand, we have the GAFAs, we have the big uh, internet companies that are building, building these wallet gardens in based on aggregator models. So you are either in or you are out, and when you are in, you can get all those services, and it's beautiful, but it's really hard to get uh, in practical sense. Well, Google and uh, some others have their APIs for getting the data out, but in practical sense, it's not really easy to integrate or build on top of the data that is Google is at the moment collecting from us. Then, uh, for example, around health application with different kind of gadgets, uh, uh, heart meters and, and so forth. You have uh, APIs already, you can call this API ecosystem, but it's really challenging to already map like how, how you are doing point-to-point -point integration uh, between these services. In, even in this model, the human, as you can see, it's sort of on, on the sidelines that it's more about human uh, consenting that you can, you can uh, connect these different services, but you don't have overall visibility on what's happening between, between different services. In my data model, the organization and uh, communication between different uh, services is, uh, is human-centric. There's an interface and tools for how to manage that. Necessarily not all data is stored in a central place, like in personal data storage, but the uh, control is centralized or somewhat centralized. It can be uh, basically an account model. So what we are proposing and building now is this My Data Operator model, uh, which allows people to manage the data flows between sources and sinks. This is just uh, uh, sort of what are the components needed for, uh, for realizing this kind of model. Uh, one, uh, one aspect of this really is that current state with consenting and, and providing uh, li uh, licenses for using your data is based on uh, um, and user license agreements, which is the biggest lie. You may have seen the documentary about this, but really like those 56 pages and user licenses, they, they are impossible for individuals. There was some study that if you would read all those I agree, not, so those uh, uh, and your license agreements in the detail that, uh, that you have been pushing, you might spend more than uh, one month in your lifetime just to read through all those documents. So, so in practical terms, it's not possible to follow up what you have agreed when you have been agreeing, donating, uh, collecting your personal data in different registries. Well, but this is not... Uh, this is not how it needs to be. Uh, in, in, in standardized agreements, uh, we have already some uh, prior art which say is encouraging. You, most people you know already that the Creative Commons in copyright side has uh, managed to create a standardized legal framework for how copyrights can be managed and different parameters of copyright systems can be managed. And the aim with different, uh, like for example, open notice program is to create a similar structure for, uh, for consenting also. So there are a couple of different programs in Europe where the idea is to build a standardized uh, legal framework for consents. And this would uh, clearly simplify and make the whole uh, approach on, on consenting more, more feasible. But this is only one, uh, one element in how do you build an operator model. Overall, uh, what is the big change here? This is a little bit uh, silly visualization perhaps, but just to illustrate the possi possible paradigm shift that is happening. So. Uh, uh, I, I, I've seen actually the same slide from Gozi.io uh, from friends, but instead of mobile phone and landline telephone, they had a mainframe computer and personal computer. But uh, the shift is the same, that instead of having a centralized data warehousing and centralized data, data storage or organization-centric data storage, you have personal, uh, individual-centric per, per, uh, personal data management approach. And so, so the paradigm shift is analogous to what happened with uh, mobile telephony or personal computing. Just uh, showing that uh, really this is not an uh, simple thing and there is not a simple solution how to uh, deal with that. The whole approach in the my data work so far has been to model this domain, make a clear communication on what kind of structures are needed and what is the infrastructure, how is it developing. Uh, this is uh, four dominant models and what kind of uh, consenting and uh, data uh, control mechanisms they are emerging at the moment. So, for example, UMA, user-managed access, 
access protocol is focused on data delegation, that's the left upper corner. Then uh, many companies are building personal data storages, but the idea is that individuals are actually collecting the data uh, somehow. Uh, refining and improving, uh, rich, enriching the data by themselves and then delegating into uh, uh, third parties. Uh, what is very important with the EU GPDR is that uh, it's not uh, just static consenting, but it's dynamic consenting, which is basically the same as repurposing. And then uh, what comes importantly with, uh, for example, public services, that they, there is other rights for delegating data than just consenting. Some organizations have right to actually collect the data and start uh, distributing it, for example, uh, public services. And, uh, and in those cases, uh, there should be notification and, and disputation rights for, for that transfer. So just some examples that need to be uh, sold and, and need to be uh, realized in the same package. But overall the whole concept is that the same data is usable if it's standardized and refined in, the, uh, in many different applications and, and when it's organized in a human-centric way. So make the data generic and make it usable in different application services and organizations. A uh, little bit like I mentioned about uh, the legal framework and agreements, so that's one, one thing that needs to be realized. Overall, we have identified these different boxes that, that need to be somehow figured out in order to make the uh, personal data uh, infrastructure functional. Uh, Currently in our research projects, we, we, we have one project that is focusing on authorization models and there the user managed access protocol is the dominant uh, tool. Uh, all out is of course one component there, but it's not uh, enough. Uh, standardized legal agreements fall also in this, uh, this box. Uh, then, for example, in Finland and, and Europe in general, there are new identity management frameworks emerging uh, like ADAS and in Finland a strong uh, identity uh, management uh, trust network or identity trust network or identification trust, trust network. Uh, uh, then uh, we have also in HIT one project focusing on personal data story, storing models and, uh, and building APIs for personal data and so forth. But this whole, whole package needs to be somehow realized uh, in order to fulfill the big picture. But uh, of course you need to uh, do it in pieces and starting with concrete pilots. And, uh, and for that reason, uh, we have started up a, a collaboration with the Ministry of Transport and Commerce, uh, sorry, uh, Transportation and uh, Communication. Uh, they have published those reports already, so two of them. And now, actually, tomorrow there's a kickoff meeting for uh, Omadata Kokeilut, MyData Pilots, which is one of the actions under the Finnish Spearhead program. And, uh, and the whole point in this program is to uh, enable a, a new kind of OMADA, uh, my data pilots uh, because like building this big map yeah. it's gonna it's not gonna happen overnight or not even probably in three or four years but you need to just figure out in different concrete ways it's step by step uh, jumping over so this is a uh, current situation of the alliance company so this was a uh, uh, actually, the situation a month ago, it has been updated quite significantly. We have new companies like Yle and CSC joining uh, tomorrow's meeting, and FSECR is also looking into this. Uh, and as a last slide, I could show, for example, one project we are doing now together with VTT and, and Tekes also that uh, that we are looking into different models how my data uh, approach can be combined with uh, mobility operators or mass. Mass services. So uh, the basic question there is that uh, who should be hosting uh, the mobility profile data? Should it be in the my data operator? Should it be more in the mass operator side? And, and basically, what would be the contents of this mob mobility profile? So what kind of uh, data elements or identity attributes needs to be included in this generic mobility profile? Uh, just uh, perhaps to show. Uh, uh, last slide, uh, we have been doing benchmarking activities uh, to understand what's happening in other countries. So the My Data concept is, uh, you can find it in uh, somewhat in UK and, most, and also in Italy. There is, for example, Telecom Italy, their project is called My Data, which is very much focused on the same principles. But otherwise, in different countries, the same principles, human-centric organization of personal data, have, have a little bit different names. But uh, there are a lot of companies who are pushing for this. Uh, there will be an EU roundtable around 
these companies, most of them, uh, in, in a month. And, uh, and there is now efforts in how to harmonize the principles of human-centric organization of personal data in Europe. Uh, it will be a long journey, but I think that the momentum at the moment is great. And, and there's been a lot of interest uh, in collaboration and also eyes on Finland. And, and uh, at the same time, we know very well that in Estonia, your X-Road project has been uh, successful and a very uh, efficient way on, uh, on dealing with uh, especially public data and uh, organization of public data. Um, Kanta is now in Finland trying to do a similar thing. Uh, we have been uh, uh, to, uh, we have been interacting a lot of with uh, with this Kanta and Oma Kanta development and also the um people in Finland and how how to realize the uh, personal data management on top of these programs so the Kanta is the, the health services and uh, Palveluväylä is the generally all all the public services uh, the goal there really is not to make the my data infrastructure built on top of these structures but to actually use them as as one of the nodes in the uh, trust network or also the we're seeing them as one operators, uh, mainly operators for uh, for public services in this trust framework. Uh, sorry that I went so fast and then jumped over many slides. I edited actually those slides, but now we didn't have time to switch for that revised version. But I hope that you you could uh, get most of the things that I tried to say. And and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Of course, we are going to deliver the slides through the website, or, or well, at least for all the participants, the registered participants, to fill the blank uh, uh, afterwards. Anyway, so if I edit those slides, so then it's easier. Just Let's do other presentation uh, while. Uh, my presentation has been installed. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Marketta Kytta from Aalto University, from uh, Department. Ouch. Yeah, this is pretty good. Now it looks good. Hey, <laughs> todellaka. Yeah. Oh my God. Ah. Good. All right. I come from a department of real estate planning and geoinformatics, where I work as a professor of land use planning. But I'm a little bit unusual as a professor of land use planning because my background is in environmental psychology. So maybe I'm the only one uh, in the world uh, having this kind of uh, professorship. So I'm, I'm very interested in human aspect in planning and design. And uh, my dream uh, since the end of 90s was that uh, when I heard that planners are using something called GIS, I started to dream that what if we would collect the experiential uh, behavioral knowledge from users also location-based, place-based, so that we could uh, look at the experiences of people in relation to the rich knowledge of play, uh, uh, characteristics of physical characteristics of places. Perhaps we could produce a usable tool for participatory planning. And, and of course, this all should be in internet to collect large pay, uh, scale data sets. And uh, I had to wait another uh, almost 10 years to, to get my dream come true. Uh, since 2005, uh, I have been working with my team to, to realize this uh, uh, PPGIS uh, uh, applications. Namely, I heard later that I'm not the only one uh, in the world who is uh, dreaming of something uh, like soft GIS. Uh, but I learned that there are other groups who are working on this kind of um, idea uh, under the theme public participation GIS. 
So uh, my uh, team has uh, realized a lot of uh, uh, th these uh, PPJS studies and also used this approach in uh, actual planning practice. And let me tell you a few examples soon. Uh, we have uh, studied, for example, social sustainability and urban densification, a very hot topic in urban planning at the moment, not only in Finland but elsewhere. We have studied child-friendly uh, environments, uh, mobility patterns of various user groups. Right now we are also uh, studying the uh, active living of the aging population, very current theme in Finland. We have uh, differentiated uh, various types of urban dwellers, urban tribes if you wish, uh, and, and also looked at everyday services and their accessibility. We have uh, studied perceived safety and uh, naturally use of urban parks. We have studied uh, ecosystem service accessibility and uh, uh, some other environmental themes. And finally, a lot of projects, uh, real life projects with real life pan planning uh, tasks and issues. And, and right now, today, I can only uh, show you a glimpse of these projects, uh, a, a few examples. First example will be about urban densification. Uh, that here in uh, Helsinki metropolitan area is a very, very topical theme, not only because of our current master plan pro process, but uh, also uh, because we are one of those cities in the world who think that uh, to, to, to uh, reach the sustainability goals, you have to densify urban structure. But that densification typically causes uh, social problems or social acceptance is not problem without problems. So we studied this team in here in Helsinki metropolitan area in nine, no, 11 different neighborhoods. And we created a soft kiss application where people were able to uh, tell about their perceived environmental quality location based place-based and, and, and then we wanted to study this uh, interesting question related to how is perceived environmental quality and urban density perhaps uh, associated and, and we did it in a little bit more sensitive way than typically because we knew where each of our respondents, but, but they, they were more than 3,000 respondents in this uh, survey, 3,100 something. Uh, we knew their home location, so we were able to look at the home density, home uh, surroundings density quite sensitively for each individual. And, and then our further analysis was based on that kind of uh, definition of urban density. So we used quite a, uh, advanced statistical tools, uh, namely structural equation modeling to, to study uh, urban structural characteristics, behavioral and experiential factors, and finally health and well-being factors. I don't go into detail our, all of our findings here, but let me just say that we found two different models. One uh, model for city center area, areas and another model for suburban settings. So we, were, we, were, we found that uh, in all neighborhoods, same laws do not apply. Uh, maybe I can tell the, uh, one of the differences between these two uh, settings. Uh, in, both, in both settings, uh, den, uh, dense uh, urban surroundings around your home contributed to the uh, better accessibility of everyday services, but in suburban settings, uh, closeness of services was perceived negatively, while in city center it was perceived very positively. So a big question for urban planners is that can they do anything about this? Uh, you know, could we uh, develop suburban settings so that the everyday uh, service closeness is not a nuisance? All right, we have done uh, similar studies among children and young people uh, and found uh, that also in that age group uh, urban density is necessarily not always a very negative thing, but it uh, also increased the accessibility of their uh, important locations. 
Uh, also, children and young people are very comfortable using this kind of new uh, method. Uh, they are able to comment their living environment, uh, place-based. In fact, I, I often feel uh, they have less problems using this kind of uh, tool than uh, adults. Uh, right now, we have been working with uh, a study that is about uh, the accessibility of aquatic ecosystem services, water areas in Helsinki metropolitan area, and identified uh, uh, over uh, actually 20, 27,000 um, personally meaningful places by water has been analyzed in this uh, uh, project and we have identified uh, interesting clusters of uh, water related areas that are important to people and studied their accessibility, whether all um, inhabitant groups have equal accessibility to those places. Uh, we have also developed a few online tools for planners. Uh, for example, here you can study uh, those clusters we have identified and asked that who are the people, who are the users of this uh, cluster, how do they come here to do what. That kind of information has actually interested uh, uh, sports department and the environmental department of city of Helsinki quite a lot who are responsible for maintenance of these places. Here's another uh, interactive online tool uh, for planners. But let me uh, say a few words about how these, these were examples from uh, research projects. Now I'm talking, of, telling you a few example, one example from real life planning projects. Here in Finland, we have a land use and planning act from year 2000, where the cities are obliged to to do participatory planning. And when does this law came, surprise, surprise, cities didn't get any new resources to, 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 to realize this participatory planning. So in reality, it has not been that easy to, 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 to do participatory planning. There are a number of problems. Only a handful of people tend to participate. Uh, participation is rather demanding from participants' point of view. Uh, cities vary how much they can invest to participation practice development. There is still lack of trust between the parties. Timing of participation tends to be very late in the process. And, and participation very often seems to have no influence whatsoever. So this is the reality of participatory planning still at the moment in Finland. So we have studied where, whether uh, PPGIS or soft GIS approach can contribute to at least some of those problems. Uh, meanwhile, uh, technically the, the uh, soft GIS development work has been uh, going further uh, and there is a startup company called Mapita Limited who is now responsible for developing this tool further. And now it, in, it has a admin, admin tool that uh, allows anybody without any coding skills to create their own PPGIS survey online. Um, very easy. Uh, you can collect data and, and then analyze it uh, without any uh, GIS uh, skills. So uh, this kind of service now exists. You can try it if you want. Please visit mapgener.com. And, and of course, this works also with mobile phones nowadays. And, and let me tell you one example. This is from Helsinki master plan process, which I already said is right now going on in Helsinki. There was, a, a, as part of its participatory planning process, city of Helsinki wanted to realize PPJS study. And nearly 4,000 inhabitants participated. And, and, and the city, um, uh, planners wanted to ask basically two questions. Where inhabitants would be willing to uh, locate uh, urban infill? Where absolutely not? Or where are the green areas that should be protected? Here are the results. Here are the places where uh, inhabitants would uh, be willing to locate new infill. Here are the protected uh, green areas. 
and, and we did a lot, quite a lot of analysis based on that beautiful material that, by the way, City of Helsinki opened up for any, anybody to for further uh, uh, scrutiny. So here we, for example, studied whether uh, where are the places where inhabitants are not single-minded. Some inhabitants might want to suggest same place for infill what others are suggesting for uh, protection. So here are, for example, a few conflicting areas. And we feel that this map shows which are the areas that would demand closer look and closer um, uh, interaction with inhabitants. Uh, when the last, about a year ago, uh, the first proposal of Helsinki Master Plan was published, and the proposal was made in a grid cell format, so that in each grid cells uh, you could, uh, the, the land use has been de defined. This allowed us to compare the, the feedback from uh, inhabitants and the proposal and to, to, to what degree it matches or, or to, if there is fit or misfit. And this is the result of that analysis. It's a little bit hard to read uh, uh, map. Therefore, I have uh, summarized the findings here. So the, the, the result was that uh, 25% uh, of uh, those uh, green areas that inhabitants wanted to protect are now uh, threatened by the proposal, the master plan proposal. So, of course, the question is, is 25% lot or little? I don't know. That is another uh, topic of further discussion now. So um, that was uh, the, an example of a uh, real-life planning project. Uh, there are a number of others. Uh, I think already here in Finland, about uh, 100 cities has used PPJS as part of their participatory planning uh, process. And we have been, Finland has been named as the only country in the world where this kind of uh, participatory planning approach has already become mainstream. Well, the latest uh, uh, step forward is that we have uh, started to, uh, to use this kind of approach also for the uh, evaluation of indoor spaces. Here in Otaniemi campus, we have had a, a uh, now is an ongoing second project where we, uh, people can map uh, or mark uh, place-based comments on, not only on the map, but of outdoor spaces, but also indoor spaces. So uh, this kind of uh, feedback has been now collected and uh, uh, this uh, knowledge is uh, hopefully used very actively now when the whole campus uh, is under renovation. Well, my final uh, comment and slide, uh, I tried to conclude um, uh, whether this kind of approach can help untying non these knots in participatory uh, urban planning. Well, I think that at least the number of uh, participants has been clearly increased. We can uh, enlarge the, the group of participants fundamentally. Uh, participation is easier if you can do it, only sacrifice 20 minutes or 30 minutes of, of your time instead of whole evening. Uh, many cities, as I said, in Finland are willing to try these new tools. There are still problems at least in, uh, uh, in the tr trust aspect and in the way this knowledge is really used in planning and whether it makes difference or not. Those are still things that are not easy and that need a lot of more work. So that's all, thank you very much. Oh, any questions or is there time? Well, yeah, yeah, there is no final discussion anymore. Uh, okay. To the point. <coughs> Please. Uh, I understand correctly that actually this uh, work is done uh, outside of uh, formal uh, specific uh, planning procedures. 
Do you mean? Well, most of these projects that have been realized with this uh, uh, tool has been part of official planning, uh, participatory planning process. Uh, but uh, the tool itself can be also used for self-organized participation for sure. Uh, there are some cases, for example, in San Diego, uh, uh, Pacific Beach, uh, this, our tool was used by a local uh, neighborhood union. So, uh, technically, the application does not uh, restrict uh, the, these different uses, but, but it has been accepted as an official participatory planning tool in many cities in Finland. So, of course, then that is probably, um, it can be more influential than uh, self-organized participation. So, any more? Maybe one question which just now came to my mind, even if I have been following your work for a long already, and we must be doing some collaboration, is that in comparison to the traditional planning events where plans are being presented and people discuss, so how do you feel that when people are sort of filling in, in the internet their own things uh, to the questionnaire, so does it then lack the, the sort of community uh, aspect of well, uh, first I, I would like to comment that there are several projects where uh, this kind of online commenting has been used to, to really comment plans. I didn't show any example of that, but there, that can be done. Uh, but, but yes, naturally, if the, everything happens online, uh, there is a possibility that that discussion uh, lacks. Uh, technically, can, you can uh, arrange discussion groups with, inside these applications. That is, that is perfectly possible, and that has been done in many cases. But face-to-face but -face discussions are different than online discussions. So I would always recommend to, to do both, to first uh, collect online uh, data like this and then uh, share, discuss it more deeply in a, in a discussion groups, for example. Okay. All right, thank you. Great. Uh, Mia, uh, the presentation because until now we have heard presentations how the smart city or, or researchers could study people and their ideas and then help them uh, in, in their daily businesses or, or, or um, survey them or anything like that. But now the perfect is totally different. How uh, Urban activist, how smart city could serve urban activists? What, what um, how to help the more active sort of thought? We'll hear about more different perspectives. Please. Okay. Thank you. So I will actually start with a quote. Um, so smarter than smart is to open up information and create possibilities for interaction in order to unleash the full capacity of the community for working towards a common good. This is by uh, Pekka Sauri, who is the deputy mayor of Helsinki, and this is from, from his book that is about city officials and social media. And I think it sums up quite well what um, today's urban activism is all about. So it's about information that is openly available for citizens' use, and then interaction and possibilities to act upon that interaction. So my name is Nea Laakso. Um, I'm here because I'm just about to graduate from Aalto Arts. The official date is actually this Friday. And um, I did my Master of Arts thesis on um, citizen participation in, um, in the urban design of Helsinki that is happening on Facebook. And more precisely, I was looking at a case. Oh. I was looking at a case, a uh, Facebook group called uh, Lisa Kaupunkia Helsinkiin. They they use um, Jimbi Helsinki name in English. Jimbi meaning yes in my backyard. And um, this group has been um, shaping quite a bit in the past few years how urban planning is discussed and even executed in Helsinki. And at the moment, it's a community of over 8,000 people 
it was founded by 2009 by Mikko Sarela. And um, it was meant to be a forum um, to discuss with other like-minded people about how, how Helsinki should be developed and, and how, um, how um, the city should um, ser best serve the growing number of citizens. And um, from the beginning, the group strategy has been uh, to focus on developing and doing and not stopping anything from happening. And um, their um, main mission is, the, is in the name of the group, which is Lisäkaupunkia Helsinkiin, and it translates to English to something like more city to Helsinki or more urban Helsinki. And it basically means that um, the idea is to make Helsinki more dense and then more livable and more urban. And, um, well, the group's activities and, and urban activism in general can be described as self-organizing. And it's quite interesting that in the previous presentation the word was mentioned as well. So it basically means that it's um, citizen-driven, bottom-to-top directed activity. And also something that is really typical for self-organizing act activities is that it's considered as something fun and making an impact in the society at the same time. And um, social media is a key ingredient in, in today's urban activism. And in, in my Master of Arts thesis, I focused on the design process of the, of the group. And um, I tackled it by visualizing it because I wanted to show um, how citizens participate I on Facebook and get things done. And I also wanted to open up and sort of guide the participants through the process. Then I also wanted to give recognition for the activists. And then um, I wanted to recognize the different phases so that the process could be developed in the future. And here is, oh no. Okay, here is the first part of the process. You probably can't read the small texts, but the main phases are at the bottom here on blue background. And um, I will go briefly through the process. So the first two phases, um, definition of problems and opening up the discussion, they are quite straightforward. Someone notices an issue or a problem that needs a change and, and shares it with the group by starting a discussion in a way or another. It can be a link to a blog post or simply a question or something like that. Um, then, then the third, third phase, um, discussion, ideation and gathering information is where the participants go m deeper into the issue at hand by discussing or finding more information by going on a field trip or reading about it or so forth. And well, sometimes just discussing about an issue is, is enough to make a change because it gets, um, it gets wider coverage through media and then proceeds with official channels. But um, sometimes the process goes on to the grouping phase, which means that there is a smaller number of people who dedicate themselves to the issue and continue discussing about it, or maybe even form, form a different or separate Facebook group or go to another platform to edit the document together or something. Then the last part of the process. So the, um, the development of innovations and decision-making phase, that's the actual design phase, even though there is design going on throughout the process. And um, the development of innovations phase, I wanted to visualize in quite small bits so that it would, it would kind of act as a, or serve as a step-by-step -step map for the participants. And also I wanted to show with the questions that, that I added there, that all the, all the different viewpoints that should be taken into consideration when designing something together. And then the last part, um, publishing and communications. That's also an important part of the process. That's when, when the project that have been, has been developed is published through whichever channel is chosen to a wider audience. And then the communications part means that it's followed up and then talked within the group because 
um, it, it does show for, for the rest, for the whole group that urban activism actually can make a change and then it obviously motivates more people to join in as well. So here are the main phases again. Um, so the process is basically all about interaction between people in various, various channels and with a various, varying number of people as well, even though most of it happens on Facebook. On Facebook. And um, well, I wanted to visualize the process so that it could be developed, so that everyone who is involved would benefit from, from it. So the city, um, so the citizens would have their say on how the city should be developed, but also the city officials would get first-hand information and maybe even new collaboration opportunities. And uh, well, I think the process is something that can be copied and, and repeated with other citizen groups. So it's not even though it's a visualization of the Lisa Kaupunkia Helsinki process, but it's quite straightforward and simple after all. But there are other points of development, and I think the main one, main main point of development is uh, uh, paying attention to facilitation throughout the process and especially in the design phase. But there's also um, another option where, or every once in a while, there is a need for other platforms or other services that can be used that have additional features to Facebook, and that's also something that that can be built upon. So about the facilitation, at the moment the discussions are really not facilitated in the in the Yimbi Helsinki group as the, the group's um, shared vision of developing Helsinki into more urban is something that is leading and keeping up the discussions because everyone shares the vision. There is a bunch of moderators, but they, don't, they, only, um, they only look at the discussions so that they stay in topic and overall appropriate. And I believe that urban activism in other groups is pretty similar. Well, in my opinion, there is room for facilitation, even though it's, it's extremely important to find and keep the balance between, uh, between, between <laughs> steering enough, but as little as possible, so that the self-organizing nature is still the main focus and main, main um, way of acting. Well, I think that the facilitation doesn't have to be done by someone who is an appointed facilitator, but it could be something done collaboratively and maybe with help of some kind of tools. And um, in my thesis, I actually made a concept for a toolkit that could be used to help facilitation in the, in the group and in other urban activist activities. And the concept includes um, a set of images that could be used as cards. And then the meaning of them is to bring more viewpoints to the discussion. And then also a documentation form that kind of follows or it follows the cards. So it would be something that the participants could fill in together as the discussion goes on. And I, um, yeah. I envisioned these cards and then the form to serve as some sort of a collaborative facilitational tool. I didn't go too deep into the technical issues as I'm not a technical person and, and since this is only a, only a concept at the moment. And I didn't even, even test or develop these tools with the group, which I think is, is extremely important to actually make something that could be done and could be used. Um, well, Facebook's functionalities can't be changed from outside, as far as I know. So I was kind of left wondering what would be the best way to make a set of tools like this that could be actually used. And I was playing um, with ideas of uh, stickers, that is a 
very basic fa Facebook functionality, but also just images, Facebook apps, or maybe something completely different, which I couldn't even think of as a non-technical person. Then also the process that I have visualized, that's something that could be transformed into a dynamic and interactive visualization, so that would actually um, be the form that could be filled as the process goes on. So it would then be an interactive map and a documentation of the project at hand, and then, then in a way help in facilitating the actions. So, um, well, I guess to conclude, um, developing these technologies or solutions and then developing interaction and participation, they go hand in hand in, in urban activism. And um, I think the best way to approach this would be, like I said, to uh, collaborate and interact with the activists and then, then open open up or well open up a discussion with them and then continue from that so that so that some sort of toolkit set of tools could be developed and then they could be actually really usable and beneficial for everyone thank you <laughs>